Chairman Powell has got one mission, that's to deal with inflation. The Fed continues to be really focused on the emerging data. The Fed's trying to get the economy in a position where inflation comes down and then it can take its foot off the brake a little bit. The Fed goes through tightening spells and easing spells and pauses. A soft landing is actually still likely. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Here come the Hawks, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. The equity markets are snooze. It's unchanged on the S&P, TK, the FX market, anything but. Yeah, get out the history books and make the history forward here to, what is it, John, 7 a.m. this morning, Wall Street time. Will the uh, Bank of England intervene to protect sterling? I mean, it's... It, it's not going to happen, but guess what? We're thinking about it. Dollar yen, 143. TK, can you imagine finishing the day and dollar yen unchanged? Yeah, well, this, yen strength. Yeah, you know, it, it's pretty elegant is all I can say. I did a very fancy study. You can only do it on the Bloomberg terminal. That's why people buy the terminal every day. And, John, we had an absolutely perfect 50% Fibonacci retracement, strong yen down to a 142 level. And now what? And the now what in every case is this will fade away over time into a non-event for the Bank of Japan. You can talk, you can nip, or Lisa, at the end of the day, you've got to talk about the underlying policy issues yes. that got us here. How much money are they spending to uh, really embrace this fiction of yield curve control? I mean, I just, I'm going to throw this out there, but they came out it's overnight. They, it's, it's reality, though. I mean, they, they, they came out overnight. They reiterated their yield curve control. They've been buying bonds at an incredible pace. I think they bought more than 2 trillion yen worth of bonds to keep that cap. And now they're going to intervene on the other side. How much money are they spending to try Try to fight a market that does not want to be fought. It's about a thought for the SNB this morning, Bramo, Swiss <laughs> National Bank. How big was that hike and what did that currency do? Okay, well, this is the interesting thing. 75 basis points, right? They actually are leaving the negative rate regime for the first time in eight years, and the franc fell the most since Unreal. 2015 versus the dollar. And this really goes to the whole thing that we saw from the Riks Bank, right? With the uh, with what we saw uh, <clears throat> just based on this idea that it's not enough anymore. You have to yeah, this is surprise important. to the upside. It, John has this tattoo to his brain, folks. Americans miss this completely. John, explain the history of the Swedish bank of being out front. It's a European thing that we don't study, and it's a big deal. Well, it's the original gangster. That's what I said yesterday, yeah. Tom. World's oldest central bank, out with a 100 basis point hike. To Bramo's point, not enough to prop up the currency. We've got the SNB doing the same yeah. thing this morning. <clears throat> Tom, I wonder what that means for Governor Bailey and this Bank of England. If he's looking at what the SMB did this morning, what the Ricks Bank did I yesterday, and what has imagine. not happened in this FX and market. And bring it over to Lagarde and the weakness in Euro that we saw yesterday, 0.9858 right now. What I would say, John, and this has been the hallmark of Bloomberg surveillance for uh, too many years, I'm afraid to mention, from Mundell to Frankel, we never spoke to Rudy Dornbush, who died so tragically and early, his uh, iconic paper of 1980. This stuff matters to all of our listeners, all of our viewers. FX matters, and we're going to lead on it. Chairman Powell, causing some problems. Futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ, we're down about a quarter of 1%. In the bond market, yields shaping up as follows. Higher by a basis point, 354 on a 10-year. The two-year gets our attention in the last 24 hours. To be honest with you, it's had our attention for the last couple of weeks. 4.1% on a two-year yield. Lisa, higher by five basis points today. So now it's over to the Bank of England. It's over to the rest of the world. And it seems like, based on what we saw overnight from the Swiss National Bank, it is going to be hard to surprise in a hawkish direction after yesterday's proclamations from the Federal Reserve. I would argue it was not the 75 basis point rate hike. It was the change in the projections, the change in the outlook. And at 7 a.m., the Bank of England has a very difficult situation. They're probably going to raise rates for the seventh consecutive time. The expectation was for maybe 50 basis points, but right now the market seems to be thinking that there's going to be some sort of outsized surprise because of that British pound and the incredible weakness that we have continued to see. This is between a rock and a hard place for Governor Bailey. They have one of the most difficult jobs. He has been out front with being honest. How low are some of the projections for the economy in the years ahead? At 8.30 a.m., U.S. initial jobless claims. I actually think this is going to take on more and more importance, especially after what we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell yesterday. They want to see the unemployment rate go up. And I go back to what Neil Dutta said. 
that the faster the unemployment rate goes up in a perverse way, the better for risk assets, because it will mean that the Fed can back away from some of their aggressive rate hiking uh, cycles. So far, we have not seen that. We've seen un, uh, the uh, unemployment claims really fall off. They've actually not gone up. And the unemployment rate is still historically low at 3.7%. And after market, John, I would say that this is actually becoming more and more important as well. The earnings, especially from some of the bellwether companies, FedEx and Costco reporting after the bell. And FedEx came out with that report earlier uh, this, in the past couple of weeks, warning about some of the fast-moving macroeconomic backdrop that caused them to revise downward their estimates. All right, let's see what they put out there now. Costco, similarly, especially with the margin story and with the respect of who is coming to their stores? Are we seeing more wealthier individuals going to more classically cost-cutting companies? That's what we saw with Walmart. Are we going to see that with Costco as well? Lisa, thank you. A few things to watch through today and into the close as well. George Conclave is joining us now, the head of U.S. macro strategy at MUFG. George, let's reflect on Chairman Powell in that news conference. Do we now believe the recession is the price this Fed is willing to pay to get inflation back to 2%? I mean, at a minimum, look, we're, we're dealing with an uphill battle here with what's going on with the dollar globally, what's going on with U.S. interest rates. Um, and I think you know, we have not seen enough, I guess, financial conditions tightenings to the Fed's liking. Um, I mean, we got a decent amount post uh, the, the meeting with, with the move in, in the S&P. But, you know, they're really going after after aggregate demand as a way to really curtail inflation. It's a massive experiment. Um, you know, it's, it's a credibility thing. They really want to prove that they can actually corral inflation. And they're they're going at it hard. I mean, it's they're, they've, they're going to hammer rates. I mean, the rates market's ready for it. I just don't think the other markets you know are ready for it. And, and it's really going to make it difficult for all the other central banks that are trying to tighten yeah. at the same time. But the Fed's going to win out on this one. George, I did a Google search last night of Fed blinks, and I was sort of stunned at how many I items came up. When do they blink and how do they blink? I mean, ultimately, and this is something, uh, not, not the only thing I've been saying, but others have been saying the same thing. Either something breaks in the market, and so far we haven't seen that yet. I mean, even though we're seeing some pretty epic moves in, in macro-type products, it's relatively orderly and functioning. And so until something breaks or the economy breaks and we see that you know, move, I think you know, Lisa's point is well taken on, on, the, uh, on the claims data. Once you see jobs data really turn, but all this stuff operates with a huge lag. And, and the real problem that I think we're facing, and this is I think it's going to be a challenge for the next uh, three months you know, into year-end, the Fed basically wants to wrap up or get very close to the end of the cycle by, the, by this year. So they're massively front-loading. We only have two meetings left. If they had given us these SCP dots in June, we probably would have dismissed it. But now that they're actually leaning on them, after years of telling us to dismiss the dots, they're using it as forward guidance. They have two meetings to turn around. That's not enough time. They're going to have to go to 4% and wait till something breaks. I want to pick up on that point. You said that there's epic macro moves right now that are going on, but things are not breaking. The market is still functioning. This goes to something that Rich Clarida, former Fed vice chair who was on with us yesterday, was talking about. He's not looking in the domestic market for something breaking. Breaking. He's looking internationally. He's looking from those risks, particularly with respect to the strong dollar and what's that doing. Where are the nodes of concern in your mind for something breaking? Look, I think uh, in general, small to medium sized enterprises that got dollar funding globally through their local jurisdictions. Uh, I mean, the dollar scarcity thing is what, you know, all central banks up or up against. And then on top of that, you have a hawkish Fed. So I think it's really the small to mid-sized companies globally that, you know, either relied on dollars or through some sort of you know, cross-border yeah. type activity <clears throat> need that sort of dollars, and they're going to be running out of them. George, you represent a Japanese bank. It's improper to ask you about yen intervention. Completely inappropriate, folks. But I do want to <laughs> ask you about yen intervention. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. But, George, why not? I'm reading Rudy, I'm rereading Rudy Dorn. Jordan Bush's 1980 paper where he literally has charts drawn by hand off his desk at MIT. Are the, are the rules of the game now the same as it was pre-Plaza Accord, post-Plaza Accord? And frankly, are the rules of the game the same now as they were in August of 1998? I mean, uh, I think what the, the bottom line kind of base feature uh, for overall to sort of like FX markets, it's all about the rate of change. And I think that's what you know, really central banks would react to. So I think it's interesting to see what happened overnight, uh, obviously, but you know, we're, we're seeing the, you know, the yen kind of come back. And the one thing that you know, historically has pr proven to be true, if it's a unilateral uh, move by a central bank, 
it usually doesn't work until there's actually more of a coordinated effort. So it's, it's too early to tell if that's actually even taking place or if it's you know something that happens down the road. But the first salvo usually doesn't stop it, right? And so this is something, it's all about the rate of change. I don't think there's a level in mind uh, in terms of what they're looking at. But I do think that you know it's it's it's, it's going to take some time. And really, quite frankly, it comes back to the Fed. I mean, when the Fed stops hiking, I think that that's going to take pressure off of all these currencies. Hey, George, thank you. You're a good sport because you basically talked about Japan too. George Kankamas there Nailed of it. MUFG. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. 145, Bramo. Is that the line in the sand? I mean, that seems to be what happened, right? I mean, uh, the yen's been bumping up against that level or bumping down against that level if you want to talk about weakness versus the dollar. And then they crossed it, and all of a sudden, uh, we heard Japanese authorities come in and say that they had intervened. So you do wonder if that's now the cap, 145. And 143 that's right now, us. negative 7 tenths of 1% on that currency pair. One of the best takes I've seen out there in the last 12 hours or so came from Ed Bradford on Twitter. The Fed has become so enamored of forward guidance that their projections are no longer what they think, but what they think they need to signal. Tom, I think that line is so important. The projections are no longer what they think, but what they think they need to signal. Well, There's a difference. I mentioned this, John, yesterday, seeing Brian Chapada's dots interpretation. It's a different dot chart than any we've ever seen before. And it, to me, it was almost barbell of two views and which view will play out. And the answer is nobody knows, including the people making the dots. This is the challenge that investors have right now. Another way of putting this, Lisa, is effectively this Fed does not want to see an easing of financial conditions. To achieve that, they're leaning hard on this signaling that we're going to be tighter for a whole lot longer. So this is where the sort of psychological aspect of the market comes into play. I feel like everyone's trying to psychoanalyze the willingness of the Federal Reserve testing how willing they will be to double down on this when the unemployment rate actually starts to go up and it becomes a political issue. That now is the question. They're trying to signal. So is this just basically game theory or are they gonna go through with it even as they see that pain hit real individuals? What did Max Kettner of HSBC say yesterday? Heads you win, tails I lose. That seems to be this market right now. Futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P. It's so on the edge of Lisa then. <laughs> I was about to say uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> you sit too close to each other. Yields up a basis point, a 10-year, 353.99. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Japan, the yen is stronger today after the country intervened in the foreign exchange market for the first time since 1998. The currency had weakened to 145 per dollar following the Bank of Japan's decision to maintain ultra low interest rates. The yen has fallen about 20 percent this year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell gave his clearest signal yet that the central bank will tolerate a recession if it can regain control of inflation. Policymakers raised interest rates by 75 basis points for the third time in a row. They also forecast that rates could be raised another one and a quarter percentage points by the end of the year. Two American military veterans fighting for Ukraine were among those released as part of a prisoner exchange brokered by Saudi Arabia and Turkey. The two were captured in June. Eight other foreign nationals were released, along with more than 200 Ukrainians. Ukraine freed a pro-Kremlin Ukrainian politician and 55 Russian soldiers. President Biden and new British Prime Minister Liz Truss have pledged to work together to support Ukraine. The two held their first in-person meeting on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. The two leaders said they would also discuss unresolved issues relating to post-Brexit trade and the Irish border. And Credit Suisse reportedly has drawn up plans to split its investment bank in three. That's according to the Financial Times. The Times says the latest proposals call for an advisory business, a so-called bad bank to hold high-risk assets that will be wound down and the rest of the business. Credit Suisse is trying to turn itself around after losses and scandals. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Answer with a simple yes or no. Does your bank have a policy against funding new oil and gas products? Mr. Diamond. Absolutely not. And that would be the road to hell for America. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Sir, you know what? Everybody that got relief from student loans has a bank account with your bank should probably re re take out their account and close their account. I'm not sure that was the answer she was hoping for. 
their Lisa and those hearings just <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> that was gold. She was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then she was like, everyone take their money out. But, you know, I get it. That's what this is all about, right? You've got all the bank CEOs lined up. Only Jamie Diamond was the one who was willing to provide that answer. Yeah, to John, the that's, F1 the, house, that's Tom, true. Just you nailed to finesse, it. You nailed, this is really important. This is really important. He's the only one who steps up when it matters. Shanali Bassett joins us now, Bloomberg Wall Street correspondent. Shanali, what did you make of that exchange yesterday? Remember, Jamie Dimon was the first one this year to step up and say the U.S. needed a Marshall Plan for energy security. So this is about energy security. It's also about inflation worries. But remember, this is one of several uh, sparring moments that he had with lawmakers about energy policy. He said the U.S. is really not getting this right. Other lawmakers, of course, took different stances on this. You had Kentucky's Andy Barr really urging the bank executives here to take a measured approach, not just to oil and gas, but to coal companies in particular. And the point that he made to Florida's Bill Posey was this, that investing in oil and gas can be good overall. He's made that point a couple of times before. What he's really worried about here is many countries moving to coal instead. So it's a complicated issue, obviously, different ideas across state lines. <laughs> but remember, he's nowhere near the only one. When you look at J.P. Morgan's investors, they've taken a very similar approach, yeah. um, and lawmakers are split. I sat on a side, stood, I should say. I, I've sat on a sidewalk in Davos, but this time I was standing on a sidewalk in Davos, and we had a raging debate about what big bankers should do to show what they do socially. And a very famous American banker said to me, American bankers have absolutely failed to sell what they do for the American public every day. From where you sit, have they failed? It's a complicated one because from where they're sitting as well, remember, there are different issues for different folks here. Rashida Tlaib, what she's worried about is not just emissions. She's worried... Oh, stop. She's worried about getting reelected. And she's... What she has been focusing on is the health of her communities, whereas Andy Barr is focusing on the jobs, the coal jobs in his communities. So, you know, if lawmakers can't get on the same page and guide John, the banks on where to go, it's okay. very difficult for the banks and the investors to follow the rules. John, remember when we talked to Brian Moynihan in Davos and sure. we just said we're not going to do Econ one one we're actually going to talk about what they do and Moynihan was freaking brilliant about the social contribution of Bank of America to America I think these guys including Mr. Diamond are reticent to sell their value every day some of those CEOs Tom are a little bit worried about regulation I'd be thinking more so about Wells Fargo than Fair. perhaps well Wells like Fargo you America, don't put it yeah Bank I, of America. I, I take you know point. Mr. Shaf Shanali may be a little bit hesitant to weigh in and join in with Jamie Dimon down in D.C. <laughs> yeah, I, that is for sure. He said those regulatory problems would last for a long time, and he took a lot of heat, too, not just for those regulatory issues, but for shrinking, which is what we knew they would do in the wake of a lot of these regulatory issues and in a tough economic environment. So he was really chastised here for cutting jobs. But I would, I have to say on the social front, what's so interesting here is they were asked the cost of environmental social government standards here, and Jamie Dimon also gave a more specific answer that it's the tens of millions now, it will be in the hundreds of millions later. And every bank CEO did agree that the cost is going up for these banks. So there is a cost. How much that cost will be? Again, this is a global issue. Yeah. Um, really quickly, really interesting here. Remember, these hearings have only happened since 2019. So there have been changes since these hearings have happened. But these committees may start to turn over quite a bit in the wake of the midterms. So some of the rhetoric that you're seeing today may be very different in just six months from now. Well, Shanali, one thing that these big banks could do for the average person is raise the interest rate on deposits. You know, perhaps they can't do this, but why have they not? And this was a heated debate last night over the dinner table. Why are you still earning zero on deposits if you see the two-year yield at 4.1%? I mean, how much is that going to become a, an issue of scrutiny going forward? It already is, and you saw them being asked this yesterday, and you see each bank CEO sit there and nod their head and say, yes, savings rates will go up. They didn't say how much. And remember, if you look at the national average, you're still looking at a 17 basis point uh, return there on a savings account. So it's not a lot to your point, but remember these banks are sitting with more than $6 trillion in excess liquidity. That was in the hundreds of billions around 2008. And, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan alone has <laughs> that much in excess. So they have saved a lot of money. They're having this dual problem of having a lot of savings and having trouble lending into a tough environment. But to your point, that is the critical question here. The lawmakers were very angry that rates were going Going up and the banks were not passing it on. We're so excited for an extra 10 basis <laughs> points before the end of the year. Shanali, thank you. Shanali Vasek.
Just unreal, Lisa, an extra 10 basis points anyway. We'll save yeah. that rant. There is a new scapegoat down in DC. It's not the bank CEOs. It's Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve. Right in the middle of that news conference, yeah, Senator I'm glad Warren you brought that up. and on Twitter, Chair Powell just announced another extreme interest rate hike while forecasting higher unemployment. I've been warning that Chair Powell's Fed would throw millions of Americans out of work, Tom, and I fear he's already on the path to doing so. It's going to be interesting, and it goes back to Phillips Curve 101. Nobody's got a clue on this, John. I, I think everyone's flying blind on this, and, and I'm really glad you brought up Senator Warren's comments to Richard Clarida at yesterday. I thought his answer was gracious and in, in, in awe. But, you know, we, we're trying to game out the parlor game here, and the weakest, the toughest thing, rather, to game out is the job market. I'm looking at claims. I'm sorry. It's a fully employed America. I won't try and game out anything. I'll just go by the calendar. Lisa, in early November, you get a Fed decision, and within a week, you get the midterms. And I just wonder what that final week of campaigning looks like if we get another 75 basis point interest rate hike. So it's not really a good idea to game out anything, but right now it is the Fed's design to actually cause unemployment rates to go up, or at least to hike rates aggressively until they see the unemployment rate go up. And this is becoming an increasing political issue. We've seen the Fed have the support of politics, of politicians, for the first uh, nine months of the year. But that was when inflation was the first and foremost concern. Now, do we start talking about the dual mandate? Is this now the messaging heading into those midterm elections, considering that the Fed is telegraphing they're going to do what they have to do to bring down inflation? The pain would be greater if we didn't. How do they communicate that well, going into year end and into next year? We saw this yesterday, basically saying, unless you have a stable price outlook, you're not going to have a stable and strong labor market. They're trying to telegraph this, right, that unless you have prices at 2%, and I think Tom actually asked a really good question to the Adam Posen point, which is, does the world stop at 3% inflation? Why is 2% yep. the inflation the target? How much is that going to become Don't increasing the question? We're going to get you going, Tom. Don't get me going. Uh, I plan to in the next I'm 10 minutes. I'm off tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So we can get them going all day. Sabbatical. <laughs> okay. Futures unchanged on the S&P. Live from New York on this FX market. Ibrahim Rakbari of City joins us in just a moment. You don't want to miss that. This is Bloomberg. Equity is just about positive. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. We're up a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500 after closing yesterday lower by 1.71%. Equities unchanged on the NASDAQ. The moves in the bond market just absolutely phenomenal. 12 months ago in the 20s, something like 21, 22 basis points on a two-year, 4.1%. Tom, we've ended the era of sub-zero rates at the S&P yeah. across Europe and the front end of the yield curve has to adjust big time. There's an assumption, John, that we will all die or we'll all fail or we'll all that. And I don't buy it. I think zombie companies that have had a gift for X number of years will go under. But everybody else will, you know, we lived it before. We'll, we'll move on and prosper. Check out this chart, Tom, at two's tens. Negative 57 basis points. You've One, got to go two, three, all four the way back, yeah. all the way back to the 80s. Lisa, to see anything like this. So the implication here is that this is going to be not only a recession, but does it sort of suggest the potential depth of one because of the work that the Fed has to do on the front end? Just shocking, some of these moves. It's really hard to get my head around. And I get your point, Tom. You're trying to throw shade at me. Some people are saying the world's going to collapse. I don't think no, that's the case. No one's trying to. We love you. It's okay. He's trying no, to no, throw I, shade I, and I love you we're, both, we're, but I, you, know, you can still throw shade. Sometimes I'm not convinced. Oh, come I on. I don't know. Sometimes you don't show us any love, but, you know. If you could I'll see the Bramo cam it. folks on breaks, you'd know she doesn't love us. John, oh, can we review Sterling here before this meeting? Me? John, Sterling, 50 beeps, 75 beeps. Do we enjoy a 111? Tom, I've got no idea. And yeah. that's the beauty well, of this BOE decision. If they went 100 <clears throat> with this currency rally or sell right. off, I don't know. We get lucky. Uh, we've got a guy named uh, 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 one of our bookers, uh, Lee, that, that is so good. He called up Bank of Japan and he said, are you guys going to intervene? We want to book Abraham Mubari. Does it work out? And of course, the bank said, yes, they're going to intervene. And so we are gifted this morning with Ibrahim Rabari. He's global head of foreign exchange analysis at City. And, and Ibrahim, to great respect for all of you, 
that do this day in and day out. I want to start with the, the monumental Rudiger Dornbush at MIT in 1980. You and I have read the paper five times. Rudy Dornbush invented it. A simple sentence. The essential complication arises from the link between balance of payments, money growth, depreciation, and inflation. Are we in a currency war, Mr. Robari? I would say it's great to be joining you on such a monumental day in uh, the world of central banking and foreign exchange. And I do think we are in what people refer to as a reverse currency war. But the reason for that is, of course, because every central bank is competing with every other to bring inflation down quickly. And that's still the central message. I think the uh, level of the exchange rate was a symptom, but the underlying uh, illness is really yeah, very high inflation across the world. And that was what right. was creating, I think, the political pressure for the Ministry of Finance to I, intervene in Japan. I did a fancy log chart today, Ibrahim, that we can't talk about on a Thursday, but it was a plaza cord, the log slope, et cetera. And the bottom line is we're nowhere near plaza accord dynamics. And yet so many people want somebody to save the day here. Who's going to save the day here in our present currency wars? Well, I, I don't think there's anybody to save the day. I think you're right on point there. And in the end, it seems like the only currency that will sustainably win this currency war is the dollar. And that's, again, because in addition to inflation, the underlying dynamic globally is the scramble to find effective hedges in a world in which there are few, few places to hide in asset markets. And that's another reason why a foreign exchange is in focus. It's not because of what's going on between interest rates and between countries. It's what's going on in markets more broadly, where both equities and bonds continue to be under pressure. Ibrahim, this raises the question of when does something break? And we keep asking this because that's what some people think will be the circuit breaker to this whole system. We were speaking with Rich Clarity yesterday. He's looking to the rest of the world, probably going to be reflected. He didn't say this. This is me saying this in the currency market, based on the fact that some of these uh, currencies are trading like Bitcoin or like penny stocks, where in the world are you looking for some sort of breakage, fissure, serious issue? Well, the, the places to, to look are relatively well known. They tend to be in bank funding markets, and they, for the, for the most part, still look very orderly. And that speaks to the lack of urgent concern around the world, and therefore the lack of a prospect for concerted intervention by uh, the world's authorities uh, to intervene. But it is the bank funding markets that would be the primary focus. In foreign exchange markets, the Ministry of Finance noted that there was some evidence of speculation. We don't think that there are particularly disorderly movements, even though liquidity has come down relative to normal times. But we simply aren't in normal times. We are drifting towards global recession, and we are in global bear markets. So, Ibrahim, when we're talking about drifting towards certain levels, they're not disorderly, it brings me to the yen. We're talking about the potential for there to be some sort of cap at 145. Is that basically what uh, the authorities over in Japan said overnight? So I think they were signaling, uh, and certainly there was some advance warning, and now we saw the actual intervention around 145. But I don't think we are speaking of a line in the sand, and that, again, speaks to the, to the lack of of control over those uh, uh, foreign exchange rate movements. We know historically for foreign exchange intervention to be effective, we need some combination of monetary policy to align with uh, the FX moves and or concerted, that is, uh, multilateral foreign exchange intervention. We don't see that coming. Therefore, we think we will probably see dollar yen above 145 right. and maybe 150 could end up being a more relevant level over time. Uh, Mr. Rabari, let me go all Stanley Fisher on you here. I just looked at Indian rupee. And I did a standard deviation study, and it's a six standard deviation pop from a negative three standard deviations in this morning up to plus three standard uh, deviations. Is the IMF ready for this? Do you have a confidence International Monetary Fund can pick four, five, six troubled entities and help? So we are concerned, and we, we do think that we have these timely bank fund meetings in, in two weeks' time, where I think these discussions will be elevated. We do think that it's quite likely that, we, that they'll be quite busy in the years to come, as that combination of slowing growth and ever-tightening financial conditions probably will create quite a lot of pressure on countries that have seen, in particular, dollar-denominated debt rise quite sharply over the last decade, and those tend to be in, in the emerging markets. I look, Ibrahim, at the moment, and let's bring it back to the majors and help us with the Bank of England. John, help me here. 23 minutes? 
24 it, minutes. 24 minutes. minutes. Sure. 23 yeah, okay, minutes we'll go away. with 23 minutes. Ibrahim Babari, how does Sterling move off what we're going to see from the governor this morning? Mr. Farrell, I'm asking for a friend. <clears throat> So we, we think the broader trend remains intact, more or less, as John said earlier, no matter what the Bank of England does, the Bank of England is between a rock and a hard place. Our house call is for a 50 basis point hike, so below market expectations. And in that case, it's very clear that we, we should see a sterling weaken uh, broadly, not just for, for uh, cable, uh, but also against the euro and other uh, currencies. Should they hike by 75 basis points, we may see a knee-jerk positive reaction, but it, over the past year, whenever we saw a slight hawkish uh, intervention by the Bank of England, that was an extremely short-lived blip. So we don't think it would be a trend changer. We still think uh, cable will fall below 110 in uh, the months to come. And even uh, against currencies like the euro, we think that sterling will probably continue to weaken. So, Ibrahim, right now everyone wants a stronger currency before they wanted a weaker one. Let's reflect on the previous currency war, the reverse of this one. Do you remember that line that came out of New Zealand that they were turning up to a, a gunfight with a pea shooter for the currency war? And I just wonder, Ibrahim, is there anything in the armory of these central banks that can actually achieve a stronger currency, given the global dynamics at the moment? We don't, we don't think there's anything, anything narrow or specific that central banks can do. If they can bolster growth, because that's at the heart, uh, and if they can uh, create a sustainable and solid financial backdrop, then we think investors are looking for safe places to hide. That's why not only is the dollar strong, but the Swiss franc is pretty strong as well. So if you can create that kind of environment, but when it comes to uh, policy actions on the day, I don't think that the central banks that are under pressure have uh, a whole lot to offer. The flip side of everything that we've just been saying, Ibrahim, is the dollar and how much further it has to go to strengthen amid the sea of potential recession in the rest of the world. What's your view? So we think quite significantly further. And, and again, the main driver of dollar strength is and continues to be this global bear market environment, the continued tightening of financial conditions. And we think that has quite a long way further to go and was reinforced by what the Fed projected uh, just yesterday. So we think for the dollar index, we should see it go above 115. We should see a euro dollar below 95 cents. And I mentioned already sterling. And even for dollar yen, which we think is in that second ca category of secondary safe havens, if you like, we still think a further upside is to come. And the turning point will be some combination of when we are on the other side of the global recession, if you like, and certainly at a time when the Fed looks to ease as opposed to tighten conditions. And that might not be until the end of next year, maybe the year after that. Ibrahim Rakbari of City, at least that's what this Fed is trying to signal. Lisa, it's the last 10 years in reverse in so many ways, from QE to QT, from keeping rates at zero to taking them really, really high from trying to get a weaker currency to trying to get a stronger one. And on that last point, it's so, so hard to achieve. Because as you know, and we've talked about this a million times, even if the Bank of England came out with 100 basis points of hikes in 20 minutes time, you would have a divide on this program ahead of that decision as to whether that would lead to a stronger or a weaker currency for sterling over the next several weeks. And that is the conundrum, the dilemma for these central bankers. Hiking into weakness, what no central banker wants to be doing, this whole stagflationary backdrop. You talk about how it's the past uh, couple of decades in reverse, and I wonder how difficult it is for people to get their heads around that and to truly buy into that. And if there's sort of a stealth transitory that's been in markets and is getting beaten out of them with every CPI report and whether the Fed is saying, as Rich Clarida emphasized yesterday, they're really serious. They're taking this seriously. They don't think it's just going to fade naturally in the same kind of way. It is a new environment that requires a new response. Has the market fully priced that in? It's something Rich pushed back against a couple of times yesterday. Tom, this idea that every couple of weeks we have this little romance with the idea of a Fed pivot and then seemingly you need Chairman Powell to come well, back and say, no, 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 okay. that's not happening. Yeah, I get the dynamics of pivot, John, but is it just a five-letter word for the word blink? I, I mean, I... I there's a point where they're just going to have to say enough. And I, I agree it's off the unemployment rate, but it seems to be very far away, as we heard from Vice Chairman Clarity yesterday. The future's positive, two-tenths of one percent. A Bank of England decision coming up in about 19 minutes. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the first time since 1998, Japan has intervened to prop up the yen. That followed the Bank of Japan's decision earlier in the day to stick with its ultra low interest rates. The yen had fallen about 20% against the dollar this year. 
The Bank of England set to raise interest rates to clamp down on inflation. Economists are forecasting a half percentage point increase in the benchmark uh, lending rate. Still, investors see a strong chance of a three-quarter point hike. Bloomberg's learned that Ukraine has seized dozens of tanks left by Russian forces fleeing the battlefield. And that adds crucial weaponry at a time Ukraine needs it. One person familiar with the matter says around 200 tanks were captured, but there's no word on how many of those vehicles were damaged or destroyed. A victory for the federal prosecutors in the case of the documents taken from Donald Trump's Florida estate. A federal appeals court says the Justice Department can use about 100 documents with classified markings in their criminal investigation. The judges paused a ruling by a lower court judge that barred the use of those documents while a special master reviews the papers that were seized. Meta Platforms has been sued for skirting Apple privacy rules. In a proposed class action lawsuit filed in San Francisco federal court, two Facebook users claim the company built a secret workaround to Apple's 2021 privacy rules and violated state and federal laws limiting unauthorized collection of personal data. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a, a painless way to do that. There isn't. We've just moved, I think, probably into the very, the very lowest level of what might be restrictive. And, and certainly in my view and in the view of the committee, there's, uh, there's uh, a ways to go. Well, that's about as hawkish as it gets. Chairman Powell there, the Federal Reserve Chair. Lisa, basically telling you that, yes, we've done a lot in the last six months, but there's more to come. And one of the biggest... Yeah, and apologies there, but one of the biggest issues there for me is this idea that suddenly he's saying it seems very likely that we're going to get a recession. Below trend growth, is that code for recession, do you think? Do you think they like to lean on that phrase instead of just saying perhaps negative and pretty dreadful? I mean... That seems to be the politically correct way to do it, but they seem to basically uh, do away with a lot of the soft landing kinds of discussions. The language has changed, Tom, in the last six months. That's for sure. The language has changed in a big way. Yeah, it is. I mean, the whole thing has changed. And yesterday I thought was absolutely fascinating. I think, John, we're so caught up in producing it and all that, we didn't even have time to realize the originality of what we heard yesterday. I like your idea, John, that he basically repeated Jackson Hole because his optionality has gone. He's on a path. Let's go. There was a moment at the start of that. I think he was <clears> responding <throat> to a question from Jada Smilek of the New York Times where he basically said, have a look at my Jackson Hole speech. Just yeah. in case you misunderstood what I'm about to say, have a look yeah. at my Jackson Hole speech. He's probably going to lean on that for the rest of this year, Tom. Well, you know, she she asked rude questions. I don't know where she learned that. I mean, probably you know, from you at some right? point here at Bloomberg. I, I have no over clue. The years. Uh, right now, we're looking at yen. Of course, 142.52 gives it back a little bit off the intervention moment. Right now, we'll brief on this with John Farrow asking smarter questions than me. With Jennifer McCune, she's global head of economics at Capital Economics, former Bank of England economist. Jennifer, um, I was in London. The part of London I was in was boom, boom, boom. And I know that's not the United Kingdom. I did walk up High Road to go up and see Tottenham play a football game, a soccer game. And it was a little bit of a different England. Just to start the basic conversation, because John's better at this than me. How flat on its back right now economically? is the United Kingdom. Uh, it does look like the UK economy is in, in a recession, has recently entered a recession, and it certainly feels, um, you know, particularly difficult on the street because these problems are really falling very much on the households, um, where, whereas um, some some benefits, some businesses, some energy companies may be benefiting for, from high energy prices for households. This is, this is just a pretty awful situation, inflation rates that we, we've not seen for decades. Do you think the fiscal decisions that are going to be made in the next 24 hours complicate the Bank of England decision that will be made in the next 10 minutes? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think in some ways, you know, they make things a little bit easier for the Bank of England setting this this price cap, which has already been been announced, um, lowers the peak in inflation from what would have been about 14.5% to more like 105 So that, that's a bit better from the Bank of England's perspective. But of course, what it's going to be concerned about is the medium and longer term in, uh, inflation implications of the boost to demand that, that the Prime Minister Liz Truss is offering, not only from the energy measures that we know about already, but from the tax cuts that we think are to come. Just to build on that, Jennifer, how concerned are you about the independence of the Bank of England if they have to go into sort of political rhetoric saying right now the policies are such, I mean, they're not going to say this, but in all, uh, for all intents and purposes, especially with the projections, that that gets extrapolated out and then used against them. How concerned are you about that? Yeah. Um, right now, I'm, I'm not particularly concerned. I think the Bank of England guards its independence very, very closely. I think it's likely to respond um, to this fiscal stimulus with more monetary tightening than it would otherwise um, have gone through with. Um, we're now expecting a peak in, in policy rates of 4% um, next year. So, so I think the bank's going to do what it can to quash sort of the demand-related price pressures that are stemming from this. But I'm slightly concerned about talk of of, um, giving the bank a new mandate or reconsidering its its mandate, and, and, and if that did stem through to some kind of government intervention in, in Bank of England policy, then that would be a really worrying development. Jennifer, a lot of the discussion post-Fed yesterday was about what the circuit breaker was for them to pause some of the rate hikes or even reverse them. And it really came down to the unemployment rate in addition to the inflation pace coming down well within that 2% target. Do we have a sense of whether it's the same for the Bank of England? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's similar for all central banks, really. And for the Bank of England, there are, there are lots of similarities to the US. The tightness of the labour market is, is a real issue. We've had a lot of people uh, leave the labour market on long-term sick, which has made, made things very tight and has led to some significant labour shortages. So we need to see how that progresses, whether those people come back, whether wage pressures start to fall off, whether headline inflation comes down uh, as sharply as we're hoping it will next year, and, of course, what happens to gas prices. What level does it begin to unravel for sterling I, I it's an unfair question to you i get that it's an fx strategist question but do you have in your head where sterling reaches a stress point can you give me a statistic to four digits uh, no <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't have a particular number in mind, but absolutely, we're looking. But the government's really taking a gamble um, here that um, it, the, the policies that it, it's implementing are going to do something to, to boost growth, start to make the UK economy look a lot better and, and maybe um, give some support to the currency at the same time. But the real risk is that there are just um, serious concerns about fiscal sustainability, about just how this is all going to be paid for, whether the yeah. government's serious about its fiscal targets. Which well, John, you mentioned Martin Wolf of the FT on this. Oh, brutal. Brutal in the FT, and many other people have been as well. Just raise a question, Jennifer. The willingness to do QT, <coughs> to reverse the balance sheet at the Bank of England, how complicated that's going to be? Yeah, that's complicated. We're looking for confirmation of, of that policy today. I, I, I think it will go through with, it, with its plans for a very gradual reduction, but it's going to need to stand ready to, to a, abandon those plans if they cause real stress in the, in the gilt market at a time when, when the, the government's presumably going to be issuing a lot of debt as well. This is a tough moment for the UK. Jennifer, thank you. Jennifer Mickey on there of <coughs> Capital Economics. Yeah, gilt 12 months ago, sub 1%, right now about 330 on a 10-year. We talked a lot about how policy used to complement one another, fiscal and monetary, through the pandemic, oh. totally in conflict now. In the next 24 hours, Tom, we're going to see a big fiscal yeah. package announced potentially from this government. And at the same time, you're going to see QT potentially from the Bank of England. Conflict. My chart of the year, John, is nominal GDP set in U.S. dollars. And basically, the United Kingdom, with a boom a number of years ago, you lived it, John, with the, you know, what you did, what you did in Notting Hill. But with, after the boom, it's been flat on its back for 10 or so years. John, I did some research on this. You know, coming out of the tots, I mean, you go to the Blue Coats pub, you How have the that? Mexicans. Oh, the Mexicans, it's loud. It's boisterous. I could barely hear myself. You've loved this experience, haven't you? But, but you know, it was I was bonding with the people of the United Kingdom away from all the shishi people where, you know, American tourists hang out. It Would was, you get a season ticket if you lived there? Oh, of course. Would I mean, you? yeah, you know, I, I mean, I would, I would, I can't imagine what that costs. Are you but. trying to make the move, Tom? 
That's where I'm going. No, it's we. You're making we. Plans. Oh, we are going back. I'm not yeah, sure Lisa Bramo wants goes. To come. We got to pack up the Bramo cam and move the line. I think the mini Bramos are on board for sure. 100%. There's no question they, they, they about are. that. They yeah, are. they're ready to get the plane with us. 100. percent Yeah, vet yeah. bills ready to go. Go with us. Yeah, <laughs> they can go. <laughs> You're going to stay, stay in New, New York. York. <laughs> you guys can have a good time. Jeff, you have been why Mellon's going to join us for the Bank of England decision. Lizzie Burden from outside the Bank of England as well. That BOE decision is up next. This is Bloomberg. Chairman Powell has got one mission, that's to deal with inflation. The Fed continues to be really focused on the emerging data. The Fed's trying to get the economy in a position where inflation comes down and then it can take its foot off the brake a little bit. The Fed goes through tightening spells and easing spells and pauses. The soft landing is actually still likely. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, and here comes another rate hike from the Bank of England from 1.75% to 250 on the interest rate, from 1.75% to 250. Lisa, 2.25, two, 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 two rather. I've read that wrong, haven't I? Forgive me. To 225, from 175 to 225. 75 basis point hike, 50 basis point hike, rather, Lisa. Clean this up, because I've completely... <laughs> Nailed that job. Well, I Absolutely you crushed that. Part, you know, part of this is my fault, because he said right before the decision, what do you think? And I said, definitely 75 uh, basis points. And it said five Bank of England officials vote for a 50 ba basis point rate hike, three for 75, one for 25, it is 50 basis points, but there was dissent. And this is fascinating, John, at a time when so many people are trying to understand, is it good or is it bad for the currency for this Bank of England to go harder? Wow, I feel bad. 225 oh, stop. 175. Stop. Forgive stop. me. Right. Guys, Sterling this is rolling so over. 112.86. We are now unchanged yeah. on the session on Sterling Tom. The way this works, and Michael McKee has the same challenge as John does, pretending to do it in real time. And the answer is literally 40 headlines come out at once and they're scrolling by in a blur and every once in a while you know you see this move this headline that and you're off by a smidgen i think john that you know it's a challenging moment for the Bank of England and they're going to the verbiage here is going to be fascinating including these headlines the guilt sales as well Lisa, yeah. guilt sales as well from the Bank of England. The vote to begin active guilt sales from October 3rd so that's going to be very interesting to see what the outcome of that's going to be well, and honestly, is this a hawkish, uh, underwhelming hike? I mean, basically, that's what we're wondering here as we look at a pound uh, that still is off the earlier lows. And I think that this is interesting, but falling nonetheless. And this, to me, is telling because what you're doing is a disappointment. Some people were hoping for a 75 basis point hike. But what is going to be the forecast and how do they deal with guilt sales to try to also bolster their firepower as they try to combat inflation? And Lizzie Burden's going to clean this one up for me as well. She joins us from outside the Bank of England. Lizzie, your take on the the Bank of England rate decision. Well, economists got it wrong. Markets, uh, economists got it right. Markets got it wrong. Uh, this is still the biggest back-to-back -back hike since Black Wednesday 30 years ago, but it still looks dovish. Remember, the Ricks Bank's done 100 basis points. In terms of the vote split, you've got Haskell, Mann and Ramsden going for 75 basis points. Dingra going for 25 basis points. So Swati Dingra was the unknown <laughs> quantity here, the new member of the committee. She replaces Michael Saunders. Uh, interesting to see that she's voted dovishly, but you did expect Mann to go for a bigger hike because she's American. She's more aware of the international context and the impact of the Fed on sterling. Uh, also interesting to look at what they now see as the outlook for inflation. Of course, they weren't meant to give an inflation forecast, but the outlook's changed so much because of the trust energy bailout. Uh, so now the Bank of England says uh, it sees inflation above 10% in the following few months. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I've seen in one of those many headlines that Tom mentioned uh, that it adds to medium term inflation pressure. So actually there's a risk that you have higher rates for right. longer because it could overheat the economy down the line. Within the, and I think it's Lizzie it's great to see the argument at the Bank of England unlike what we see in the United States. Do we know from these headlines what Governor Bailey thinks or does that wait for the press conference? 
We've got to wait for the press conference. I've got to say, Tom, I saw the governor earlier. He loves to walk in through the front door, even on Bank of England Day, but he wasn't giving anything away. Uh, what we know is that the bank's still saying it's going to act forcefully on inflation. I don't think markets would say that this is acting forcefully on inflation, but perhaps the Bank of England wanted to see what comes out in the mini budget tomorrow. A big question is how much do the MPC know about the Chancellor's plans for tax cuts and uh, whether there'll be supply side reforms as well included in the announcement tomorrow. Hey Lizzie, thank you. Jeff Hughes is going to join us now from BMY Mellon. Jeff, your reaction to this Bank of England rate hike? Looking for 75, and uh, to be frank, and uh, I think the market will just take it in its stride for the time being. Um, tomorrow is far more important compared to uh, today because they're looking at an inflationary impact you know, from uh, the uh, energy support measures uh, over the medium term. But once the tax cuts and national insurance cuts and any other forms of fiscal stimulus come through, that's going to be a different story. So right now, do you see this as actually stemming some of the declines? Do you see that the uh, sort of pound resilience over the past 24 hours is going to stick? Or do you think that this just portends more weakness ahead? For the time being, because of the upside inflation risk, and as acknowledged, um, but tomorrow markets are going to be looking for fiscal credibility. The fact that the Office of Budget Responsibility has not been uh, allowed to you know, publish its forecasts, and I think that you know, has cast a little bit of a shadow over things. Uh, but ultimately, these are very large numbers we're talking about on the energy support side. On top of that, you've got tax cuts and limited revenue generation right, right. now. I think the new government's counting on growth. Jeff, you so much of this is do you have the luxury of economic growth? And you can go country by country to this. On a blended basis, does the United Kingdom have the luxury of economic growth to do these different experiments? So uh, growth can only be stimulated you know, by deregulation and uh, lowering the fiscal burden on households and corporates. And crucially, with the energy support program, if that helps the household and consumption, 70 percent of the UK economy at the end of the day, if the household now feels a bit better about going out and spending, maybe we can get growth. Um, but it's still you know, going to be a tricky environment. OK, but so the 2.5 percent, I believe I'm not read in on this, but 2.5 percent is the hope of the trust government parse that out from, let's say, zero out to 2.5. If they get to 1.25, does that help anybody? To start off with, but it'll still be considered below trend. Um, but just having a growth number alone, uh, I think you know, that's something uh, isn't uh, Beijing's in the business of doing, you know, rather than the old uh, old lady of Threadneedle Street um, or Downing Street, right? So I think you now that has um, unnerved things a bit. I mean, when we spoke um, last time, these are very unmarked things, right? Uh, setting a growth target uh, is an unmarket like behavior. Uh, so that sets about uncertainty. How are you going to try to achieve that? Uh, it, re it remains yeah. to be seen. But again, the government's about unleashing the consumer and the corporate through tax cuts. We're stirring right now, 1.1306, pretty much unched across the arch from 4 a.m. Wall Street time this morning. Jeff, you, I've got to ask you about yen, about Bank of Japan on this historic day. Maybe it's sterilized, maybe it's not. Who cares? Maybe it's coordinated. Maybe it's not. Who cares? Do you have any idea the impulse that they use to make this intervention? I can't figure out the how much of it. How much did they throw at the market to make for a momentary strong yen? Time uh, they acted um, boldly, and um, bold was the key word, you know, from the Ministry of Finance. One hundred and seventeen billion dollars equivalent in November two thousand and eleven, right? I, but that was buying dollars, you know, trying to weaken the yen. This is the other way around, right? So um, it's asymmetric. I think we're talking, you know, mid double digits, something like that, to send a statement to do it consistently. That's going to be interesting. But they're not going to be alone here. I don't believe it's coordinated. But now they've, um, you know, opened the floodgates. The rest of Asia is going to follow. China's controlling things already. I'm sure Bank of Korea um, and also you know, authorities in Thailand, um, you know, Taiwan, for example, but will be. Looking at this, maybe the, the SMB can start to think about liquidating some of its dollar assets. That's a nearly 40 percent of their book is in dollars. Uh, so will this signal a turn in the dollar led by central banks? I think that's going to be a new theme for markets coming through. But this kind of rearranges things a little bit. I mean, I was asking this earlier. How much money are Japanese authorities spending to preserve the fiction of yield curve control, to preserve something that really goes against markets that absolutely want to tear it away? How much can they continue to do this kind of thing? Do they have enough money or is is going to become punitively costly. Question of uh, Mr. Kuroda as well. I believe nine billion dollars equivalent was spent, um, you know, this week um, to uh, uh, to enforce some, um, you know, YCC. 
it would be so much more efficient you know, if they let that go. Then we could see 135, 130 very, very quickly. And the Minister of Finance will just push things along. But th at this point, still the two things are pulling against each other. It's all about trying to make sure dollar yen perhaps doesn't go through 145, 150 kind of a range. Pushing it lower, that's going to be very, very expensive. So we'll see where the BOJ is um, over the next coming weeks or so. Hey, Jeff, thank you. Jeff, you there of Bank of New York Mellon on the latest from the Bank of England and elsewhere. 225 on a Bank of England rate, 175 previously, 50 basis point rate hike. And your currency looks like this, 113, 113 on sterling. Positive by about a third of 1% at the moment, Tom. And the next event is a fiscal event for the UK. Yeah, as, as Jeff, you mentioned, this is a big deal tomorrow. John, what do you look for tomorrow? We could potentially, Tom, get tax cuts and more spending. And I want some more detail as well on the energy plan. Lisa, we've had some details, I'd say a little bit of clarity around the consumer portion of this energy relief. We need a little bit more, a whole lot more in fact, for what's going to happen with businesses. It's kind of interesting that the Bank of England is saying that the energy price guarantee cuts inflation yeah. uh, over uh, five uh, percentage points in 2023. And this goes to this push-pull of, okay, on one hand, it'll lower headline prices, but on the other, it'll allow people to start investing and spending that much more in other places. I really find it interesting that the pound is strengthening on the back of this because we actually saw an underwhelming decision based on a number of uh, market expectations for 75 basis points. I wonder if people are going to start saying less does more if it means the economy can grow more later on. The split was interesting, though, wasn't it? Yes. Five officials wanted 50, three wanted yeah. 75, one for 25. I wonder what that means for the next decision, Tom, and what that split looks like then. Catherine Mann owns a high ground on this. She's not once but twice created original research in academics, John. She's hugely, hugely respected. Uh, her work uh, at Citibank and then on to the Bank of England. And for her to go to 75, I think, speaks volumes about where people like Jeff, you are. She wanted the front loading. She talked about yeah. that a few weeks ago. Lisa Shannon is going to join us in the next hour, 8 a.m. Eastern time, the CIO of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Live from New York City with futures negative, about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ 100, down a third of 1%. From New York City, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the first time since 1998, Japan has intervened to prop up the yen. Now that followed the Bank of Japan's earlier decision in the day to stick with its ultra-low interest rates. The yen had fallen about 20 percent against the dollar this year. Two American military veterans fighting for Ukraine were among those released as part of a prisoner exchange brokered by Saudi Arabia and Turkey. The two were captured in June. Eight other foreign nationals were released along with more than 200 Ukrainians. Ukraine freed a pro-Kremlin Ukrainian politician and 55 Russian soldiers. President Biden and new British Prime Minister Liz Truss have pledged to work together to support Ukraine. The two held their first in-person meeting on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. The two leaders said they would also discuss unresolved issues relating to post-Brexit trade and the Irish border. Bloomberg's learned that the Securities and Exchange Commission is set to let Wall Street keep payment for new order flow deals. The practice can involve one brokerage routing retail stock trade order to another firm for execution rather than to an exchange. Backers say it's led to commission free trading, but critics question whether traders actually get the best price. All of this is part of an SEC overhaul of stock trading rules. And the holiday season is starting earlier this year at Target. The retail chain is pushing its holiday discounts into early October to try to recapture its momentum. Meanwhile, Target plans to hire about 100,000 seasonal workers. That's similar to last year's amount. Earlier this week, Walmart said it would scale back the number of holiday jobs. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Time will tell if it's enough, but I do think today is an important move in the, in, in the direction. So there's a lot of talk that they might do 100 today. In the end, they didn't. Right. But as you mentioned a moment ago, they essentially got the effect of that and maybe in a more durable way by putting it into later rate hikes.
Just absolutely fantastic to have the former vice chair of the Federal Reserve, Richard Cloudy, alongside us as that decision from the Fed came out. And on the other <coughs> side of the news conference as well, particularly when Chairman Powell wrapped things up much, much earlier than I thought he would. That it's was got a abrupt. habit in the last month of keeping things short, I think. The Jackson Hole speech was about, what, eight minutes long, Tom? And then yeah. the news conference stopped 20 minutes early, something like that. They, they all improve. Um, everybody who gets into the bright public lights, they get better as they go along. But this guy's getting more savvy, I think, John. I think he, you know, he's more taking charge of the moment. And, you know, you and I were talking Tots football while he was ending the press conference. I had to spin the microphone around quickly so <clears throat> yeah. we could pick up. Yeah. Lisa, we're almost on the same level as, as OPEC Plus and <laughs> yeah. those kind of meetings. Just keep it short. You know, it's pretty clear cut. 15 minutes is all you need. That's all you to need. To make decisions that shake the world. I mean, it makes it clear, right? And if you need any guidance, then just check the speech I just said because nothing's I, changed. I thought, to be honest with you, at this point, because he struggled in news conferences just in terms of the interpretation of the market sometimes. To see the, the Nasdaq up 3 4% off the back of a Fed decision, keep it tight, keep it focused, keep it short, and refer back to earlier material, yeah. which is essentially what he did, Tom. And they're data dependent. That's all there is to it, as uh, Dr. Clarida uh, mentioned as well. Right now, Dr. Fitzpatrick joins Jack Fitzpatrick's in Washington. And Jack, I want to open it up to the time of the season. The leaves are changing in Central Park. The browning of the leaves is an American tradition. The election nears. And I've always had trouble with it's the economy stupid. I don't buy it for a minute. It's about crime. If you're on one side of the fence, it's about a different theme. If you're on the other side of the fence, does inflation really, really matter? in what we see November 8th? Yeah, it, it does. In this case, the slogan about the economy and its role in, in politics is a, a pretty accurate one. It's not always the case, but that's the overriding theme. Yes, crime, uh, the border, those are Republican uh, points of focus, but the economy and inflation is a, a major uh, issue that the Republicans are running on, and the Democrats have felt the need to try to address. Right. They're campaigning on what they have tried to do the role of the uh, tax and climate bill, uh, reducing the deficit, the chips bill, uh, that it should have somewhat of a disinflationary effect. Uh, it's it's okay. limited what Congress can do, but it's it, that is the topic of conversation as we get toward the midterms. But a given congressional district, and I know the Cook report came out and shifted some seats yesterday, and to guys like you, that's a, a big deal. We can identify the Republican non-economy platforms. What are the Democratic Party talking points against crime and the rest of it that the Republicans speak of? On crime, you have seen the Democrats move back toward the center compared to, you know, that June 2020 conversation about defund the police. The president has talked a lot about funding for the police. Uh, and on the micro scale, the uh, fact that they brought back earmarks, I think, plays back. It plays into that because you have a number of Democrats all over the country who have given you know a, a couple million here a couple million there for small town police radios that kind of thing that's that doesn't come across as a major thing but it's something that a lot of uh, moderate democrats talk about is funding for local police that basically is the democratic response uh, on the border issues they have talked past it a bit more there haven't been major visits to the border by a, a bunch of democrats that's that's a Republican talking point that oh, wait, doesn't wait. have as loud a yeah. response from Lisa, Democrats. Lisa, the border's coming to Martha's Vineyard. That's what we're talking about. Well, and putting aside those highly political uh, issues, which are really important, going back, Jack, to the point of police radios for smaller uh, police units, it goes to a larger issue of have Democrats lost the rural vote? What's your view? I, I mean, long term, it has moved away from Democrats, but the question is how much can they chip into what has become a, a Republican advantage? Um, and, and that kind of thing is, is the challenge, not only uh, funding for police, uh, but to, to what extent, I think the, the key question for a lot of Democrats is to what extent can they separate themselves from the big federal issues that you've heard of uh, and criticisms of the president, criticisms on the economy, and come back with parochial issues. That's why it matters whether 
whether it's uh, you know an earmark for uh, small town police radios or you know they they come and and spend on wastewater if you can make it almost seem like you're running for mayor rather than running on big federal politics that is something that helps uh, the the Democrats who are on defense now the parochial <clears throat> politics and things yeah. that get to their local issues Lisa earmark it comes from a livestock term where the ears of domestic animals were cut in specific ways so that farmers could distinguish their stock from others grazing on public land. Gross. Well, I mean, it's an earmark. Clearly, you're reading the Farm Journal, and I have I am. extensive I read experience it daily. In, with the Farm Journal. Uh, just to hear, Jack, I, I'm thinking about what you just said, and this idea of trying to act like local politicians and run for sort of like local races. How much are we looking at a move away from saying the Fed needs to do what it needs to do with inflation, and increasingly we need to get more jobs, better jobs, bring back jobs, reshore that kind of talking point for the Democratic Party as they head into a, a much more parallel less economic time. They largely have not campaigned on either message of uh, on one hand, this is the Fed's job, or even trying to say, well, look at the flip side of the coin, that jobs came back, there was a, a jobs recovery so suddenly. Really what they have campaigned on is the limited opportunities that they have had in Congress to address inflation. Uh, the Democrats are campaigning on the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, may not be the most accurate name, but it, was, it, it reduced the deficit uh, on the CHIPS bill. That kind of thing that should have a disinflationary effect of some sort. It, 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 to be honest, probably the role of the Fed is downplayed on the campaign trail, even from Democrats, uh, because they at least have a couple talking points on uh, bills that theoretically would have a disinflationary impact. And it's, it's much more advantageous to talk about what you did do, even if it doesn't have a huge impact on inflation, rather than uh, sort of shrug and say uh, that, that's up to the Fed. So the, the talking points are more on what Congress has managed to do, uh, even if it may be fairly limited on inflation. Hey, Jack, thank you. Jack Fitzpatrick there down in DC. I just wonder how quickly this changes. This Federal Reserve is engineering a slowdown that is set to lead to higher unemployment. And that is not a bug. Lisa, that's a feature of what they're trying to achieve. How much longer can all politicians on both sides of the aisle say the Fed needs to do what it needs to do? It is their job to bring inflation down. When does that start to change? Futures negative two tenths of 1%. Yields higher again on a 10 year, 356.34. From New York, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg. Equities a bit lower, rolling over here, down a third of 1% on Crushed. the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down five or six tenths mm. of 1%. Soft and negative on the rust, sort of small caps down four tenths of 1% also. In the bond market, you know the theme, don't you? Yields higher, yields a bit higher again on a two-year by six basis points to 4.1137%. Just sit on that for a minute. 4.11% on a two-year when we were trading 12 months ago like, at something like 20 basis points, Tom. And even at the start of the year, something like 70-something at the start of the year, just a monster, monster change. It's like back to 1875 Every, or something. Everything I mean, has you know. to reprice off that, Tom. Yeah, everything. I agree with that. I agree with that strongly that we reprice off of short-term paper, and that's certainly what we're seeing, and that's into this liquidity uh, discussion. John, important research coming out on the history made today by uh, the Bank of Japan. George Cerevelis with always a sharp note. And he models out maybe something in the order of 1% of reserves were used on this intervention exercise. We'll know at the end of the month, he says. Uh, but far more importantly, this is what it's about, credibility and about use of reserves. And I love what Jeff, you said earlier. This is asymmetric to the reverse currency uh, currency war, John. This is, a co this is a nation that wants to strengthen their currency that's way harder to do than to weaken your currency. Whistling in the wind, Tom. Yeah. They've got the FX reserve, sure, but they need the underlying policy to shift. If yeah. it's the Fed or if it's them, <clears throat> the Fed's going hard. And this is why twos tens is shaping up as follows. Twos yeah, tens. And, and look at Sterling, John. 112.86. Basis points. I'm looking at the two tens. tens. 
you can take a look at sterling too because you look at the front end of the yield curve on gilts two-year bond yield up 13 basis points wow. just big changes yeah. all round, lisa at the front end of the curve and really shaking things up in the fx market yeah, this yield curve uh, inversion is not doing any favors to any of the banks, possibly the reason why people are not getting more income when it comes to their deposits. I'm watching the banks today, uh, in particular when it comes to European banks. We've been talking about Credit Suisse yesterday. I did not make any recommendations in the break whatsoever, but we did hear from Financial Times reporting this morning that they're considering a plan to break the bank up into three different units, including a bad bank, and then selling off structured finance units in the United States, potentially cutting thousands of jobs. This is all of the speculation as reported by the Financial Times. Those shares lower by about 1% in pre-market trading. Year to date, it's been a much more punitive uh, kind of pathway. We'll get to that in a second. But Deutsche Bank, interestingly, is up 5.5% today in a sort of tale of two banks that once were lumped together. Uh, and this comes as Bloomberg is reporting that they are potentially going to put out revenue guidance at the upper end, that they're actually doing better than they had previously expected. If you take a look year to date, you could see both have suffered dramatically in line with the banks and possibly uh, much more so for Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse shares 48 percent decline to five dollars if you look at the ADRs uh, so far this year. Deutsche Bank shares down a little bit more than 30 uh, 30 percent. How much more is there? And, and Tom, you've been talking a lot about Credit Suisse. How much is there a, a remedy here or is this going to uh, just be a sort of slow bleed? It seems like the Financial Times reporting that they're going to have some sort of pretty major restructuring. Well, this is a zombiness, Lisa. I'm sorry. We've got a risk free right now. As Taleb says, it's about physics. Finally, the gravity's back in physics. These are important states. Statements. I mean, is Credit Suisse a zombie institution? That's really what this comes down to. I don't mean to be rude, but that's the question. Well, they're trying to isolate some of their zombied uh, or their uh, sort of devalued assets in a bad bank, trying to isolate that so that they can save parts right. that really are functioning. Uh, let's see, Tom. Let's cut to the chase right now on fixed income. And again, yield is an equivalent to a price of money, if you'll read Fabozzi 101. The Bloomberg Total Return U.S. Aggregate Index is back to where it was on price in early 2019. Ed Al-Husseini is Senior Interest Rate Strategist at Columbia Threadneedle. Two weeks in a row he's joined us. It's just too much. Ed, uh, good morning and thank you so much for joining us again. What is the ramification for retail and institutional non-spread investors to see the bond price in the U.S. back to the spring? of 2019. Yeah, look, I think on a total return basis, this has been an exceptionally painful year if you're exposed to interest rate duration, uh, really from two perspectives. One, outright yields have increased from uh, you know exceptionally low levels, and, so, and therefore we delivered those negative returns. But also, the correlation of rates to risk has turned positive. So you're not able to offset the negative return in duration with positive return in, in risk assets. So it's, it's, it's been an exceptionally painful period. Tell me about international bonds, notes, and bills. You've got currency to play with there, currency front and center in the discussion. Are you looking completely domestic at Columbia Threadneedle, or are there opportunities in the international carnage? No, we're looking across the board. And you know, to your point, um, the Bank of England, the Fed, the European Central Bank, and, and obviously the Bank of Japan are at different stages in, in, in their policy normalization process, the Fed being most aggressive, but the Bank of England and the ECB catching up, and obviously the Bank of Japan has continued to ease. I think that creates really interesting relative value opportunities in both the rate space in FX. Uh, in FX, no doubt, the dollar uh, you know, continues to dominate uh, developed market currencies. But in the rate space, as the Fed gets more aggressive and as the inflation problem in the U.S. is in some ways more tractable than the inflation problem in the U.K. and in Europe, um, relative value in U.S. rates, in my mind, is, is becoming a lot more attractive versus uh, the U.K. And, uh, and, and core European rates. So are you saying, Edward, that you would be going into 10-year treasuries right now? Yeah, and again, look, I think we have been a little bit early in this view, but as the Fed continues to regain that credibility in the front end and bring forward the probability of a recession, the long end should naturally be uh, a safe haven and a more attractive uh, place to be. Now, what we don't know is what's the final destination, what's the terminal rate, 
Uh, we think we have a decent amount priced in in terms of where the Fed could go, about four and a half, a little slightly north of four and a half percent by next year. But that should create value in, in the long end. We're not quite there in the UK and in Europe yet. Priya Misra of TD Securities agreed with you yesterday, and she said that we do uh, seem to be getting close to peak rates in the 10-year yields, that she's starting to see uh, some attractiveness there. How much does this give you confidence to go further down the risk spectrum to, for example, investment-grade credit in the United States, other aspects of corporate debt where it doesn't seem like the credit risk is that massive, but you are getting more significant yield? Yeah, we've liked the front end, uh, so short maturity investment grade debt. Again, in the background, corporate balance sheets remained very healthy. Uh, they continue to deleverage in the investment grade space. And short maturity investment grade debt benefits both from the rate kicker, from uh, 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 treasury rates rising, you know, north of 2%, uh, sorry, north of 4% on the two-year note, uh, and of course, spreads being uh, exceptionally volatile this year, so getting both a spread kicker and that, that yeah. high starting level of, of, uh, of yield. So the income component yeah. there, to me, looks quite attractive right now. Spread kicker was such a great band. I loved what they did with Nickelback. Ed, I'm looking at the U.S. Aggregate Total Return Index. It's a five standard deviation move uh, down, looking on a 30-year great disinflation, great moderation trend. Critically, we moved from about plus three standard deviations. We've had a seven or eight standard deviation move in your bond world. How do you make it back? In equities, you grow revenues, you make it back. How do you make back these losses in bonds? I think income is going to be the, the key component. We will claw back. Uh, this, this process will take some time, no doubt, given the drawdown this year. But the starting level of yield and therefore forward-looking income right now is looking pretty good. Um, again, look at real rates, 10-year real yields are north of 1%. Uh, obviously, nominally rates uh, are, are, are quite elevated as well. And, and so the expected income going forward um, is, is quite attractive. And I think that's going to be a much bigger component of total return from here than it was, say, several years ago. Ed, wonderful to get your thoughts today. Thanks for being with us. Ed Al-Husseini there of Columbia Threadneedle Investments. And I'm sorry we keep missing you in New York when we're in London. He's in London when we're in New York. I want to look at one currency we'll pair. Next week. Euro Swissy. Euro Swissy, Tom. This move, this is a two percentage point move right. <clears throat> against the Swiss franc in the euro's favor yep. after a 75 basis point hike from the Swiss National Bank. This is exactly what Jeff Yu was talking about. It's asymmetric. I just did a comparative standard deviation study. You can do this on the Bloomberg Terminal, folks, in seconds. John, the move in weaker Swiss franc this morning on a standard deviation basis is more substantial than the attempt by the Bank of Japan to strengthen yen. And that's the asymmetry Jeff Yu was talking about. Is this what happens, Lisa, when you don't deliver a 100 basis point hike? and you only go 75. I mean, it's, it's a major move, 2% on an FX pair like that one. And yet we're not necessarily seeing the same kind of weakening in the pound, even though they didn't come in on the more hawkish side with respect to their rate hike. Uh, and then you saw the uh, Swedish central bank come in with a 100 basis point rate hike and the currency still sold off. So, I mean, try to make sense of this in terms of how you respond to different central bank parameters. Very difficult. I'm looking at yen crosses in G10. Just a snapshot on the Bloomberg. WCRS Go, for those of you interested, change the base currency to the yen and you get a decent picture of things. The yen's eating into everything. Against the Swiss franc, Tom, it's a three percentage point move. What's against it on, the Swiss franc. Well, go north, south, Pacific Rim. What's the Aussie yen look like off WCRS? You want me to have a look at Aussie yen right now? Well, yeah, I'll do, do that, that for you <laughs> very quickly. In real time, Tom, Aussie yen at the moment, it's a move of 1.4% in yeah. the yen's favor. There you go. I mean, these are seismic uh, moves. We're going to keep abreast. We say equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, and I'm sorry, they all link together. Somehow, Swiss franc movement links into Apple Computer. Futures right now, down two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. You might have to explain that one later, Tom. Yeah, the Nasdaq, yeah. down a third of 1%. Yield tire by a couple of basis points, 355. Yeah. Those were the days when the central bank wanted a weak currency, would buy foreign stocks. Tom, all that craziness, no more. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it's historic times. And frankly, John, looking at the screen, getting scale here is tough to do. It's changed. From New York, Big time. this is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Policymakers at the Bank of England have voted to raise its benchmark interest rate by a half percentage point. Three of the nine members wanted a 75 basis point hike. That could build up expectations for a bigger rate increase later this year. Bloomberg's learned that Ukraine has seized dozens of tanks left by Russian forces fleeing the battlefield. That adds crucial weaponry at a time Ukraine really needs it. One person familiar with the matter says around 200 tanks were captured, but there's no word on how many of those vehicles were damaged or destroyed. Shares of Robinhood are surging. Bloomberg has learned that the Securities and Exchange Commission will stop short of banning payment for order flow. That's a major source of revenue for the brokerage. The decision is a win for brokerages that get paid for processing rights. Goldman Sachs has cut its 2023 economic growth forecast for China. The firm predicts that Beijing will stick to its tough COVID zero restrictions through at least the first quarter of next year. Goldman says China's GDP will probably increase 4.5%. That's down from a previous projection of 5.3%. And Amazon has lost a bid to exclude its billionaire founder Jeff Bezos from having to testify in a Federal Trade Commission probe. The company filed a petition with the FTC last month arguing that the agency's information and interview requests were unduly burdensome. Now, Chief Executive Officer Andy Jassy was also included in the failed bid. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. With respect to the expectation that inflation will fall and will fall quite dramatically with what is priced into that dot plot to those median estimates, the, the market is there. Uh, but it's important to remember that the FOMC's projections can be wrong. Uh, the market can be wrong. Just a fantastic lineup yesterday after the it Fed was. decision and news Our conference. Team it. Thank you to everyone's contributions. Matt Lazelli of Deutsche Bank, Priya Misra of TD, Scott Minard of Guggenheim, of course, Richard Clarida, <coughs> together with Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock. Diane Swank of KPMG. How could I leave Diane out? Just a fantastic lineup yesterday, and thanks to all involved. Futures right now down about a quarter of 1% on the SP 500. A lot of south side research coming through. This from City moments ago. It's pretty straightforward. Quote Powell and the committee plan to move nominal rates above underlying inflation, resulting in millions of newly unemployed individuals to relieve inflationary pressures. This is not a positive scenario for risk, Tom. Now we see it with the VIX 27.86, a spike up to 30 during the carnage yesterday, but we come back down and have to see how equities play out. We've got eight ways to go here on radio and television across America this morning. We go to Britain and what John knows, and I get lost in the streets, you go out, I can't pronounce them right, Leadenhall and Fenchurch. John, you go beyond the Bank of England, out past, you know, that pub where I have a beverage of my choice, and you end up out in the world of David Blanche Flower. I think it's called Aldgate, John. Okay, and you East, end East up, London. Sorry. You end up in a different London than the fancy stuff we're talking about every day. Danny Blanche Flower joins us right now. Danny, it's fantastic yeah. to catch up, and I think we should start there. At the heart of these decisions, what do these decisions mean for everyday Brits, everyday Americans, when City are basically saying millions are going to end up unemployed? And the question I've asked, and I think you're perfectly positioned to try and answer it, is higher unemployment a price worth paying to try and get no. inflation down? No, well, we have a lot of evidence. I mean, the central bankers forever have said how important inflation is, and they just kind of guessed it. So there's a huge body of literature that I've contributed to, and we look at What's the, what's the impact on the country's well-being, if you like, on the wealth of nations, of a one percentage point rise in unemployment compared to a one percentage point rise in inflation? And the answer is it's absolutely clear, between five and ten times worse. So a new paper says that the rise in unemployment that they're going to bring about is ten times worse than the problem they're trying to solve. And, and you started this thing out. We, I've been talking a lot about the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus. And what I mean by that is... So, so the Bank of England sits in the city of London. One mile away is the Mile End Road. It's called the Mile End Road because it's a mile from the city. And it's where the two worlds collide. And the question is, what's going on that's going to help the bankers and the city folks that we talk to and the woman riding the bus on the Mile End Road? Right. And the answer, it seems to me, is that 
is that we're, we're seeing disaster coming. We're seeing rises in interest rates in the UK when the Bank of England's agents today talk about slowing demand, slowing output. Um, the Bank of England forecast before the rate rise that there's a high probability of deflation and that output is going right. to fall over the next three years. So what are they trying to do for a problem that's not about demand-driven inflation? And the other thing, John and, and um, Tom, I think we really should think about, in a sense, you guys talk about this all the time, but there's so little dissent. The story at the ECB, the story at the Bank of England, the story at the Fed, we've got to do things about inflation, we've got to raise rates. Okay. Potentially, <clears throat> this is going to crash the economies, Prof and it'll all be much worse. Right. Professor Blanchflower, I stood in the bottom of our building here in New York with Secretary of Treasury Tim Geithner, in the right. heart of the financial crisis, and Geithner brilliantly laid out that they needed to extend the x-axis and use right. time to heal the wounds. Are these central banks that are panicking because they refuse to send uh, to extend time to extend the x-axis to in exactly. to diffuse inflationary impulse? Well, that's absolutely right, Tom. I mean, the, the thing that strikes me as very interesting is these central bankers seem to want to respond to every piece of minutiae that comes in every day. Their job is to focus on the forecast horizon, what inflation is going to be, let's say, in two years' time. But if that causes all kinds of problems, there's no reason why you shouldn't say, OK, let's let inflation come back to target in three years or four years. I mean, that's absolutely allowed. And the sensible thing probably to do is to see if this temporary shock dissipates. So you could sit there and say a sensible path would be to sit and wait and watch. But again, where's the dissenting voices? They're all saying the same thing based on zero data. They have no precedent to this. And the danger is that uh, the soft landings are not going to come. I mean, the forecast yesterday from the Fed said output's going to be fine. Unemployment's going to rise just a little bit. And raising rates to 4.5%. No worry, it'll slowly bring inflation down. And that's for Gaga land. That's not going to happen. Danny, is there, are there any circumstances under which you would argue for raising rates? Well, of course. Obviously. I mean, the re absolutely. So but, what, so what, what course, are the scenarios that would cause well, you to say it is important I mean, in to in a sense, that's a conditions. stupid question. That's a stupid question in a way. I mean, what we've seen since 2008 is the mother of all shocks. We saw the mother of all shocks negative shock to output in 2007-8, which you had to counter. If you hadn't counted it, Ben Bernanke said unemployment would have been 25%, so I'd buy that. So now what we have are giant shocks, I mean, a giant shock from the COVID and from the war. We don't know how it's going to recover. So why would I want to punch the labor market and punch demand before I really know what's coming. I mean, it's as if they know what's coming because they clearly don't. So under these circumstances, supply-driven shock that essentially is going to drop out. My guess in the United States and in the UK, we'll see very low uh, inflation by June as those big numbers, one-off big numbers that we saw dropped out. So I would have not been voting for rate rises because of the large negative shock. And the debate over the last decade is about the scale of that negative shock. Danny, Danny, it may be a stupid question, and yet some people might be wondering that because they're taking a look at CPI where it is and saying, why wouldn't you uh, want to raise oh, rates? So and then, I mean, I'm just saying this. Why you wouldn't. Wait, so from here's, your here's perspective, you from yeah, your perspective, you what data point would you be watching to prove what? your point every week? OK, so let's just go with the claims that the Fed has made and the claim that I make. So what you got was a couple of once-off events, which are basically driving the base effects. You've had inflation of 0 and 0 0.1 in the last two months. If you just take 2012 to 2019 and you impose those inflation shocks over the next eight months, inflation gets to 1 by about June. If you go back to 2008, same date, July 2008, Inflation was 5.6%. It was minus two a year later. So the question is, everything's being driven by the base effect. So I would be watching and waiting. Danny Blanchflat, thank you, sir. What a I clinic. Thank you. A, I thought it was a phenomenal question, by the way, <laughs> Sir Brown. It's <laughs> no. but not now. I've just never heard Danny ask for a rate hike. So, you know, I was interested too. Danny, thank you to Lisa as well, to Tom Keane, <clears> from me. I'm going to go get a wisdom tooth removed now, Tom, so 
You're flying solo. I cause that. It's my you fault. two together. Yeah. Into the John, I just opened my, my monthly best. statement, and that Austrian I bought, remember the end of 2020? Yeah. How's that going? The 98-year Austrian. Mm. I'm down 65%. That was the first time you dabbled out of cash. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Triple every dollar. Back then it was 100 bought. years. Yeah. I'm down 65% on that puppy. Futures, Tom. I've you changed okay, on John? the S&P just about. Should Lisa go? She get, can hold Get in hand. touch with me in an hour and see if I'm okay. <laughs> in the NASDAQ, we're down this about a tenth of 1%. From New York, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> The FOMC is strongly resolved to bring inflation down to 2%, and we will keep at it until the job is done. They need to risk a recession in order to bring inflation down. That doesn't mean the Fed won't make a whole new set of mistakes, which is what I'm worried about. It's important to remember that the FOMC's projections can be wrong. The market can be wrong. Time will tell if it's enough, but I do think today's an important move in the direction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen. John Farrow, out seeing Dr. Do You Floss. Uh, very <laughs> important moment for him, and we hope he's, he has is, is our prayers. He has our thoughts and prayers. Lisa Bramowitz and myself will get you through this truly historic day after the Fed meeting. Lisa, just to generalize for radio and TV, Powell acted many respond. Yeah, and it's not just with respect to the markets, but also central bankers around the world. How do you readjust at a time when the dollar is ascendant, when you have this Federal Reserve that is going to keep hiking until it sees the whites of 2% inflation's eyes, right? And this really is going to offer up a real conundrum for central banks globally. It is. And of course, folks, the intervention in, in Japan is absolutely historic. I love moments ago, Lisa, Ben Emmons with an exceptionally thoughtful note at Medley, and he frames it right back to 1998 right back to 2011, and that there's more work to be done, not only in intervention, but also in this crazy yield policy they have. Okay, so here's the question. How far can they go with this, right? I mean, basically, what was the note that you were pointing out that George Cervellos point, put out there, that 1% 1 of reserves of is a reserves, working number right, right now. That yeah. was what they used to create a little bit of a floor, at least for the valuation here versus the dollar for the yen. How much longer can they go? And what happens to markets? Do you get that breaking point? And I think that that's actually one of the key questions going forward. When does some of this market activity become unruly? When is it something uh, that has to be, uh, I guess, addressed in something more cohesive? We're going to dash to the data check right now because our guest is so important on what to do with your assets, your money forward. Lisa, help me here with the data check. So much going on. Equities give me a mixed story. The, the VIX went out above 30 and pulled right back into 27.68, maybe a more quiescent response. The Dow just still above 30,000, didn't get to the 29,000 level. Lisa, what do you see in bonds this morning? Well, what you're seeing is a front end that just won't quit, right? 4.11% on that two-year yield, and I think that's really important. Also, though, in the currency space, and this sort of goes to the scene that we've been talking talking about over the first two hours of the show. How do other central banks respond to this? The Swiss National Bank rose, raised rates by 75 basis they points, officially way. left uh, the mm. negative yield regime, which had been an eight-year regime, and their currency is weakening the most since 2015. What is the path ahead right. in this currency war to get a stronger currency at a time when nobody wants anything other than the dollar? For those keeping score at home, let's be clear. The Swiss went one way the Japanese went another way. Maybe that's called a currency war, Lisa? I mean, and a very different one than the ones that we're used to over the very past Very different. Of that's really, really important. As Jeff, you said earlier with BNY Mellon, it's asymmetric, so to say the least. We need to solve the carnage in your portfolio. Lisa Shallot with us, Chief Investment Officer, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, and we readjust this morning. Are we rebalancing, Lisa? Are we readjusting? What are we doing amid the carnage? Well, look, our, our advice to our clients is certainly that we should be rebalancing here. You know, what we have said is this is a time for uh, active risk management. And what we mean by that uh, is taking um, a maximum level of diversification. That means diversification by sectors, diversification by technical factors, diversification 
uh, you know, by region. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I know it's not popular right now right. You know, to speak about, uh, uh, you know, American investors owning uh, non-U.S. stocks given relative outperformance of the last decade. Uh, but, you know, we think that what's going on in the currency markets is material uh, and that this this divergence ultimately uh, will mean revert and, and that uh, there is going to be some catch up. So we're recommending, uh, you know, maximum active management, diversification right. and, and things of that nature. I really look forward to speaking to you because I want to talk about the strange word scale. And I'm going to go back to the great Peter Lynch at Fidelity who got angry one day and he said, look, I care about your 47th stock pick, not your number one stock pick. There seems to be so little to choose from, Lisa, a la Mike Wilson. How do you get scale or diversification within U.S. equities now if you've only got so many good ideas? Well, uh, I actually, um, I might push back on that. I think that, you know, underneath the surface of, of the S&P 500 index and even the NASDAQ indices, um, you know, we're finding real opportunities. There has been carnage in this market. We know that in small and mid-cap land, there's been carnage. We know that there's a host of uh, sectors that, that have sold off aggressively, including things like home builders, uh, you know, again, contrarian perhaps, uh, but where, you know, a lot of the bad news or likely news is discounted. Uh, and so we do think that there, are, you know, are, are things to accumulate out there if you um, are willing to do the fundamental work. I mean, I think one of the uh, you know, one of the challenges for a lot of investors is the last 13 years have been dominated by a handful of stocks in the U.S. with a growth orientation in the tech and, and, and communication sector. And people didn't have to do much work because they could just buy the index and get uh, the job done. Uh, this is going to require uh, homework uh, navigating in these markets. Um, and this is when active managers actually you know, uh, for good or for bad, earn their fees. And, um, you know, we, we think that that is the place to be. Does that mean, Lisa, that you think the headline figure for the S&P, for example, could trade sideways for years? Uh, I do. I am, uh, you know, more in that camp. I mean, I think that one of the things that has continued to surprise me uh, is the extent to which equity investors have been willing to hold the levels of forward multiples that we're holding in the face of decade high interest rates. We know mathematically and fundamentally that the movement in interest rates higher should equate to lower price earnings ratios. Um, and, you know, yes, have we pressed down a bit from where we are in January as the Fed funds has gone, you know, from zero to, uh, you know, three? Uh, yes, we have some. Uh, but, you know, you know that we're also in the camp that the current figures in terms of estimates for forward consensus earnings estimates for 2022 full year and then 2023 probably remain too high, especially if we're in this debate about, you know, recession, no recession. Um, and so while, you know, the current pricing in markets at, at 3,800 and change may suggest, you know, a sub 17 times forward multiple, uh, if you adjust those earnings down, we might be back at 17 and a half, 18 times forward. And so this market has more work to do in terms of, quote unquote, get, getting real. So who is going to be the leadership? And I ask this because it sounds like in your scenario, big tech cannot be it anymore. Correct. I, I, I think big tech is going to have to consolidate. And I think those valuations are going to have to come in. And I think that they're going to have uh, the come to Jesus moment, which says, yes, these are great companies. Uh, but they are no longer great stocks because everyone knows the stories and expectations are extraordinarily high. Um, you know, the reality is that they do operate in the whole big wide world, yeah. global world. The global world is slowing. The U.S. dollar uh, is a material headwind and inflation and cost pressures uh, are realities for uh, yeah. them as well. So new leadership, you know, from where we sit um, is likely to come from different areas, areas like healthcare. Uh, areas like uh, energy right. industrials that may benefit 
um, from uh, some of the, the infrastructure right. and capital spending that we think is going to occur over the next couple of years. Lisa, are we at a point, and I'm thinking of Andrew Mellon in the 1930s on transactions and combinations, are we at a point where the zombies roll up? I mean, we finally at a point where the real interest rate market, which was a gift the zombies had for 17 years, whatever the number is, is this the point where the zombies end? I, I love what you're saying, Tom, because I do think that that, that is going to be the next phase here uh, where uh, the, the cost of capital does start to pinch. Uh, I do think that those who have, uh, you know, strategic capital to deploy, uh, you know, are going to be able to to um, go out and, and acquire some capabilities. At the same time, I think some of those zombies are going to go by the wayside um, yeah. and, and uh, you know, starve from not being able to get financing. Uh, Lisa, um, yeah, got to leave it there. Lisa Shell, thank you so much. Terrific brief there on actually what to do with your capital with Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. You know, you think of Wither the Zombies, Lisa. I, I, it was a Rush song. I can't remember. Moving Pictures. I can't remember which album it was on. But, you know, I'm going to say, Lisa, forward, I'm all over this. It's a, I've mentioned Nassim Taleb a couple times this week, where all of a sudden the G is back in physics, the gravity's back, the risk-free rate. You can do actually do a sharp ratio now. And to me, all these zombies disappear in one way or another. I'm going to have the Cranberry song in my head for the rest of the day. This no. really does hinge, though, on this <clears throat> question of financing. And Lisa Shalit pointed to this, right, that it's going to get more restrictive. It's going to get more difficult for them to find the financing in a cheap way in an era of high interest rates at increasing credit risk, and we're not seeing it yet. And this goes back to the Bob Michael point of J.P. Morgan Asset Management in his conversation with Jonathan Farrow, where he was saying, this is actually a huge point of argument within his team. Do you buy at yields that look good at 8% all in, or do you wait for them to become 12% because suddenly people are not going to finance those zombies? Yeah. And this is one of the key questions. That's called doing an Austrian debt. Look at <laughs> You're really, still burned from that, huh? Really worked out. Sterling on this day of the Bank of England, 11317 on the edge of Unched. Please stay with us. Coming up, Abby Joseph Cohen. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Policymakers at the Bank of England have voted to raise its benchmark interest rate by a half percentage point. Three of the nine members wanted a 75 basis point hike that could build up expectations for a bigger rate increase later this year. For the first time since 1998, Japan has intervened to prop up the yen. That followed the Bank of Japan's decision earlier in the day to stick with its ultra low interest rates. The yen had fallen about 20 percent again to the dollar this year. Two American military veterans fighting for Ukraine were among those released as part of a prisoner exchange brokered by Saudi Arabia and Turkey. The two were captured in June. Eight other foreign nationals were released, along with more than 200 Ukrainians. Ukraine freed a pro-Kremlin Ukrainian politician and 55 Russian soldiers. Shares of Robinhood, they are surging. Bloomberg has learned that the Securities and Exchange Commission will stop short of banning payment for order flow. That's a major source of revenue for the brokerage. The decision is a win for brokerages that get paid for processing rights. And the holiday season is starting earlier this year at Target. The retail chain is pushing its holiday discounts into early October to try and recapture its momentum. Meanwhile, Target plans to hire about 100,000 seasonal workers. That's similar to last year's amount. Earlier this week, Walmart said it would scale back on the number of holiday jobs. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. In order to punish the aggressor within the institutions, we shouldn't turn a blind eye to propagandists who justify aggression, but apply a full package of personal restrictions against them. That is a punishment for lying. 
Let's get out front. And on this year of 2022, let's suggest he could be man of the year for Time magazine. Mr. Zelensky of Ukraine, and of course, Ukraine that has had a momentous 14 days in their war with Mr. Putin. Lisa Bramlett and Tom Keene in New York. This is a week of, well, Lisa, traffic in midtown Manhattan. Yeah. How about that traffic that we all see with thousands descending uh, for the United Nations General Assembly uh, meetings and much more? Far more importantly, there's a migration in October to the meetings of the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Someone who knows the schedule is Sergei Nikolaychuk. Deputy Governor of the National Bank of Ukraine, and we're honored that he could join us today uh, amid a terrible, terrible war. I, I need to go, first of all, to a simple anecdote of your Kiev. You're educated in Kiev. You have seen the transformation over 20 years. How does Kiev recover back to what you knew when you were younger? How do, how do you see that happening? Actually, Kiev changed dramatically. For the last uh, 20 years, uh, before the war, it looked like a normal European city, capital of the European country. So you may uh, you, you was able to enjoy the restaurants, clubs, uh, shopping malls, and so on. Definitely changed uh, uh, changed sizable since the beginning of the war. So Kiev was completely empty in March, April. Mm -hmm. So nowadays the life is uh, recovering, coming back, coming back, yeah. but uh, right. still you feel uh, you feel the consequences of, of the war on a, on each step. Gorgieva of the International Monetary Fund has a few distractions away from your war. Mm -hmm. What is your unique message to the International Monetary Fund as you cry for help? What is the distinction you say versus all the other headaches they have around the world? Uh, definitely Ukraine needs the support from the International Monetary Fund. So we are very uh, grateful for the International Monetary Fund for providing us $1.4 billion uh, under the RFI at the beginning of the war. But uh, so far we need more and uh, we are ready to engage into the uh, full-fledged uh, uh, program. So, in, uh, mainly, so mainly we focus our efforts in order to launch the uh, EFF program of the large scale and uh, the authorities are fully functional and ready to uh, negotiate and to discuss the policies uh, for, mm -hmm. in order to, uh, to launch uh, such type so of program. Sergey, we've been talking a lot about central bank rate decisions over the past week, uh, and we've gotten a lot of them in the past 24 hours. You recently kept the rate unchanged. How do we even have monetary policy and try to keep a normal sense of monetary transmission in the face of a war, in the face of such incredible disruption in day-to-day -day, uh, commerce that it becomes sort of not really a main feature? Yeah, definitely. Our uh, approach to the monetary policy changed dramatically since the beginning of the war. Before the war, we uh, relied on the inflation targeting framework, very similar to many other central banks all around the world. But at the beginning of the war, we uh, uh, we moved to another setup. We started to rely heavily on the uh, stability of the exchange rate. Uh, we supported our actions on a fixed market with uh, uh, tough capital controls. And uh, after some period of uh, adjustment, uh, so when we keep kept the interest rate uh, stable at 10% in early June, so we raised it to 25% in order to uh, help ourselves to uh, to maintain the stability of the exchange rate. And uh, um, last two, uh, our last two monetary decisions were to keep this interest rate at 25% at the same time. So as you rightly man mentioned, so we struggled to improve the monetary transmission, which was not perfect before the war. And definitely it's, uh, uh, it is uh, even worse uh, since the beginning of the war. But so far we see that uh, our decisions, so they, they, are, uh, right. they are translating to the banking rates 
more or less uh, as we expected, and uh, we hope that uh, tighter monetary conditions right. will help us to maintain the f uh, stable exchange rate. What will it take on the fiscal side? And you were talking about the IMF aid and how much you might potentially need. How much would you need and how long would it take overall to rebuild the economy in a way where you could go back to something more akin to normalcy? Okay, so frankly speaking, the losses from the war are mm, tremendous. So that uh, uh, relates both to the current situation when we have a huge uh, budget gap, which we have uh, to help to finance uh, from the central bank uh, side. And actually this year we already provided mm -hmm. uh, uh, more than $10 billion to, 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 the, to the government in order to support the essential needs, uh, financing the essential needs. And at the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, that puts a right. sizable pressure on the fixed market. Yeah. You are you, we're running out of time here, Governor, and mm -hmm. so I've got to keep this short and abrupt, and I'm being rude in, mm -hmm. in doing that. Ukraine has had a courageous two weeks. The news flow has been extraordinarily good in the military front. What do you need from the allies right now? What do you need from Mr. Biden and the West right now? Definitely, we need the continuation of the support, both on military front and also for, uh, and also continuation of financial aid. So we uh, prove uh, to the whole world that we have uh, we, we may uh, uh, we may we may win, and uh, we hope that with the continuation of the support from the democratic world, we will achieve the victory oh. as, as as soon as possible. Thank you so much for joining us at Bloomberg today, Sergey Nikolaychuk of the National Bank of Ukraine here among this week of disunited uh, nations. Really an extraordinary set of meetings, Lisa. I'm going to call it post-pandemic. It's just shocking to see the consecutive rate hikes and it's sort of who can out-hike the next in order to try to get some sort of stability in the currency. It's interesting, though, this conversation that we're having, and it highlights this delicate balance between fiscal and monetary. For so many years, monetary took precedence because it could, and now fiscal is sort of offset and they're not in sync and it's going to become a really political issue in the years to come. It's a new experiment and certainly, folks, we've seen that in the last number of days. If you're just joining us again, Bank of England with a modest surprise, 50 basis points, not 75. Sterling, 113.25. Had a 112 handle a bit ago. Equity markets quiescent. The VIX, 27.57. Dow futures up 80 points. And that is a good point to speak of Abby Joseph Cohen. In this historic 2022, the professor from Columbia Business School. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Bloomberg surveillance on a Thursday. It's a Thursday of the Bank of England. Yesterday, a, Thursday, a Wednesday of the Federal Reserve. But we go right back to the news that matters, and that is the state of the labor economy for Jerome Powell. And with weekly claims, Michael McKee. Michael, what do you see this morning? Well, Tom, the Fed raised rates because the labor market is tight, and the labor market is still tight, 213,000 claims. Uh, that is the same as last month, unrevised, waiting for the revision to come across. But it does tell you that uh, we are seeing a very strong labor market, uh, still uh, an, a chance for people to... Um, get jobs even if they had uh, lost their job because continuing claims continue to fall. 1,379,000 compared with 1,403,000 last uh, week. Well, these are two, two weeks behind, so um, the, the week before last. But it does show you that this is an incredibly strong labor market. At least it's showing no signs of cracking on the letting people go front. Uh, there was obviously a big exchange between mm -hmm. uh, the chairman and me yesterday and the chairman and others about unemployment and how high they're willing to let it go. But right now, right. it doesn't seem to be a problem. Mike, is the Phillips curve in order right now? I mean, that didn't really come up yesterday, but I thought there was a, the real nuance of questions, starting with uh, uh, nonlinear uh, items early in the conversation, then over to your rudeness later, made for a really interesting press conference. And within that is the theory, the canon theory we grew up, the Phillips curve. Is it in place? It's still there, but it's being l overlooked at this point. Uh, there is a big debate about whether or not it still holds. There was before the pandemic because uh, the, the Fed viewed it as extremely flat. 
But right now, because of the fact that the labor market has been, uh, the labor force has been so small, it's kind of hard to tell. Not enough people going right. back to work <clears throat> and an awful lot of job openings, and that shouldn't happen. Usually, if you have that many job openings, it lures people back to work. So uh, they're looking more at the uh, absolute numbers. And of course, as we pointed out yesterday, um, these are all backward looking. So it's hard for the Fed <clears throat> to know. But jobs claims are pretty contemporaneous, and right. they do show People are still on the job. Mike McKee, thank you so much here. With the mixed futures, uh, red and green on the screen, the VIX 27.58. Is this joy, and how did we know it was an historic day of Japanese intervention, Bank of England action, to have Abby Joseph Cohen with his professor at Columbia Business School, a modest career at Goldman Sachs as well. Abby, thank you so much for joining us here uh, to keep us informed on the underlying finance and equations, the mathematics of these equity markets. Abby Joseph Cohen, suddenly the sharp ratio matters. I guess beta matters again, but outside of beta, we've got the risk-free rate and it is returned with a vengeance. Are we revisiting the sharp ratio? Are we back to the articles you wrote for the CFA years ago? Tom, a uh, wonderful question. And I'm going to respond by giving a bit of a prologue which is that many models are broken, uh, have been broken during this period of time because they typically respond to cyclical phenomenon. For example, your question uh, to Michael before about the Phillips curve. And the reality is that there are so many structural changes in the economy and the markets as well that a lot of those models uh, simply have not applied. Some of them are coming back in force. Uh, the Phillips curve, for example, uh, had no way in its model to reflect the fact that there was a pandemic, uh, that we have had this generational shift in labor force participation, by which I mean the baby boomers are now stepping out of the labor force. And the other thing, of course, is that we have had a four-year uh, deceleration, if you will, in terms of immigrants coming into the United States. And over the prior decade, immigrants filled 60 to 65 percent of the increase in employment in the United States. So there are a lot of things that are different within the market itself. A lot of the models haven't applied for a while. Keep in mind this weird 20 to 30 year period in which interest rates and inflation were extraordinarily low. And to your point, real rates uh, reached negative levels, um, something we had never seen before. Uh, I, for one, now I'm answering your question, uh, I'm happy to see that the Fed is now focused on making sure that real rates, real yields are in fact positive. And does the market believe them? Uh, and the reality is that we now have a flat to inverted yield curve, which suggests to me that bond investors at least are, are giving the Fed uh, credence and credibility in terms of believing that the Fed policy uh, will have um, efficacy. Abby, are you saying that stock markets are not accurately reflecting the fact that inflation would be higher and would remain higher even after this uh, cycle collapse if the Fed were not to keep rates at a much higher level than they had been? Um, another very good question. Let me just talk about what happened yesterday in response, uh, and that is the equity market didn't know what to do. Um, first it was up, then it was down, then it was up, then it was down big time. Uh, there was really erratic behavior because to your point, Lisa, uh, equity investors are really confused because there is this yin yang between inflation and higher yields versus will the economy and earnings continue to grow. And I think we're now at a point where given the significant rises in, um, in interest rates and yields across the yield curve since the beginning of the year, the equity market is now focused much less on inflation and yields than it is on earnings. And there, there's a lot of confusion. Um, investors are not sure uh, how this is going to play out um, for the rest of the year, let alone for, for 2023. Uh, we see, for example, that there are ongoing adjustments to the consensus earnings forecast. But let me point out, we are starting at record profit margins. Um, right. It's not as if prof profit margins and ROE were low. ROE for the S&P 500 is in excess of 20 percent. Um, you know, so if there is, in fact, ongoing profit margin squeeze, I think the impact overall is not dramatic. 
The impact, however, in individual sectors may be significant. Do you see the possibility of a lost decade, Abby, given the fact that we're trying to readjust and renormalize rates, renormalize some of the uh, financialization of the economy? You mean a lost decade in the profits, in GDP, yeah. in a lot of things that people harken back to the 70s about? Sure. I mean, if, we, if you look at the valuation of the U.S. equity market and some other markets as well, at the end of 2021, they were at record high levels in terms of where we were on percentiles. Almost every valuation model was between the 95th and 99th percentile, indicating, in my view, overvaluation. Uh, unless you believe that the dream scenario of extremely low interest rates and strong profit growth would continue uninterrupted. Uh, so where are we now? Uh, the valuations are roughly at average levels. Um, S&P 500 PE, for example, is about 16 times earnings. Um, and given where we are, even with the rise in uh, interest rates, that's not a bad place to be. So when we talk about the lost decade, let's talk about two different phases. Number one, we've now had a 20% correction in share prices from record high levels and record high valuations. Can we get back that 20%? <clears throat> I don't think that happens over the next several right. months. Um, over the, the next few quarters, I think the economy will slow, earnings growth will slow, uh, but I think it's possible that we could see higher equity prices. I kind of peg that along the same lines of the growth in earnings, which is probably, right. uh, why don't we call it 5 to 10% uh, over the next few months. Abby, a few years ago, you wrote an iconic paper for the CFA Institute. You mentioned an old strategist I used to talk to named Aristotle. Aristotle never saw a bond market with yield up, price down, and the losses that we've seen over the last year and a half. How do bond investors recover given this historic carnage? The damage clearly has been much more dramatic in the bond market, and in some ways the overvaluation in bonds was much more extreme. We had central banks around the world who kept interest rates nominally extremely low levels, and real yields were low in many countries. You know, Two-thirds of major economies, not the U.S., but two-thirds of major economies had negative real yields. So the damage that we've seen in the bond market, um, I, I, I think it was expected. When we look at government bonds, it's one thing. The damage in the credit markets um, is something that we've not yet seen fully rolled forward uh, because a lot of those are illiquid securities, and I think we're going to see uh, more damage damage ahead. But for the uh, average investor who is willing to buy, for example, an individual bond um, and now can get a 3 or 4% yield, uh, depending upon uh, the maturity they're willing to, to take on, uh, that is something that is well, one of the best opportunities in 20 years. Very good. Are you liking teaching, Abby? I mean, this is a whole different act for you. You, you, you surviving Columbia? Do you throw chalk at people? I do not throw chalk because we use whiteboards. Um, so okay. if I'm going to throw Markers. anything, it's going to be a marker. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving it, Tom. It's, it's a great right. opportunity for me to uh, be involved in the next generation. Wonderful. You look tanned and rested. Thank you so much. Abby Joseph Cohen, professor at Columbia Business School. Thank you so much for joining us. I think it's fascinating, Lisa, to talk to her with her equity uh, cred about the bond market losses. I just think it's tangible. Especially because she said that there are some opportunities that may be the best in 20 years, even though she did seem to suggest that oh. the credit market hasn't fully priced in this pain. Fascinating moment. And we're going to be talking about that, by the way, coming up with Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo and Subhadra Rajapa of Societe General. 210 spread, negative 53 basis points. I mean, folks, we're looking at the screen here saying not never, but yeah, never. We've never seen this kind of move in bonds. And you hear people like Abby Joseph Cohen, Michael Darden saying, let's go. This is the time to act. We're all, we're all frozen. The last time that we saw an inversion like this was 1981 yeah. of this magnitude. And are we heading back to that era? And that is a pretty significant question. Yeah. And uh, one that will frame no. out the next decade. You know, we're, we're frozen. I mean, I'm looking at triple levers, all cash, and I'm going, let it go, let it go. <laughs> this is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Bank of England has delivered a second straight half point hike in its fight against inflation. It was a split decision, though. Three of the nine policymakers voted for a bigger rate hike. The BOE also endorsed plans to start reducing government bond holdings built up since the financial crisis over a decade ago. Bloomberg's learned that Ukraine has seen, seized dozens of tanks left by Russian forces fleeing the battlefield, and that adds crucial weaponry at a time Ukraine needs it. One person familiar with the matter says around 200 tanks were captured, but there's no word on how many of those vehicles were damaged or destroyed. A big sale for Airbus and a big blow to Boeing. A unit of China Southern Airlines has agreed to buy 40 Airbus A320 Neos. The base price is almost $4.9 billion. The actual price will be lower after discounts. The planes will be delivered starting in 2024. Boeing has historically counted China Southern as its biggest customer. And Bloomberg's learned that SoftBank Group has slashed the valuation of Oyo Hotels on its books as it heads to an IPO. The once high-flying Indian startup was valued at $10 billion in 2019. Now SoftBank has cut its estimated value to $2.7 billion. In Manhattan, the hot rental market ended its six-month streak of record-setting prices in August. New apartment leases were signed at a median price of $4,100, down $50 from July's all-time high. That's according to appraiser Miller Samuel and brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate. The August median was up 17 percent from three years ago. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The reality is we take a mild recession today and eradicate inflation now because we know the mistakes of the past. That doesn't mean the Fed won't make a whole new set of mistakes, which is what I'm worried about. It is Thursday. Diane Swank, chief economist at KPMG, yesterday with Richard Claret, the former vice chairman of the Fed. I thought Ms. Swank and Dr. Claret are really were just lights out in their interpretation of the view forward. We look forward to reducing that uh, early November. Right now, and I'm doing this for Global Wall Street, is a clinic. Ira Jersey, long ago and far away, worked for Global Wall Street. And he wrote the kind of notes where you'd get angry at him because they were eight pages and you had to read every line, every paragraph, because they were loaded with intelligence about stuff you flunked in bond exams. The teacher joins us this morning running all of our interest rate strategy at Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, I want to have a clinic right now on this strange word, liquidity. In the old days, it was commercial paper. There was the wonderment of understanding LIBOR. It was out of like a Mary Poppins movie and all that. Great. It's all been blown up. How do you measure liquidity in the fixed income space in 2023? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of different ways that we that we look at liquidity. One is obviously simple, like the bid offer between um, uh, between those people looking to buy, those people looking to sell. How wide is that? Where do market makers make those markets? And that has gotten a bit wider, particularly since the Federal Reserve backed off from its bond buying program, and then it's just gotten a little worse since the uh, since the Fed started to actually run off its balance sheet. And then second, and I think this is important, and this is that plumbing you're talking about, Tom, and that's the repurchase agreement market. So what's going on under the hood? How do levered investors, so investors who are buying bonds with leverage, how do they get leverage and, and at what price do they get it? And they do that through the repurchase agreement market for treasury securities uh, and, and for a few other uh, bond markets as well. And, and that market has not grown very much at all, while the treasury market is now four times larger than it was before the global financial crisis. So you're looking at it at an environment where it's just harder to get as much leverage as you used to. And because of that, the kind of the you know, let, let's say that the pipe is the same size, but there's a lot more water trying to get yeah. through that pipe. And that's really the problem right now. Should we be concerned about this plumbing? There's a doom crew that you and your career have pushed against every day. There's a doom and gloom crew that's going to write this weekend that the plumbing, the plumbing is fractured or rusty or broken in the banking fixed income space. Is it? Well, I, I 
I think it is in some ways, and, and part of this has to do with the regulatory environment that shifted a decade ago after in, in response yes. to the global financial crisis. So banks and dealers now have to hold a lot more capital, even against their treasury securities, which if they're not supposed to have credit risk, why are they, you know, why do they have to hold a lot more uh, credit against it? So this is the reason why um, uh, there a lot of regulators, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, are pushing toward things like central clearing of securities, because I guess theoretically, and the hope is that by having central clearing of treasury securities, um, it, it'll just make things flow right. a little bit easier. People won't have to worry about if they're going to be delivered a bond or not, and and if people are going to fail in in actually executing that that transaction and clearing it. Um, so, so so there are positives from trying to do that, but I think the bigger issue is just the amount of leverage in the system versus the size of the market. I think that's the that's probably the bigger issue for why right. you're seeing moves of ten. 15 20 basis points some days uh when on you know very little market news we harken back and particularly this week with all going on in foreign exchange to 1998 and part of it was it wasn't transparent there were unknown unknowns as dr alarian would say do we have a knowledge of the liquidity of the american finance system or are there unknown unknowns out there shadows if you will <laughs> well, there probably are unknown unknowns, and that's obviously scary because if there were, you know, known unknowns, then we would at least have a clue as to what we should be looking for and looking at, right? But but um, but we don't. So so you know, th there's always potential exogenous factors that could play into the financial markets, right? We had that that significant, you know, a 15 minute, 50 basis point rally in Treasury securities in 2015 that is still kind of a baffling, right? There there has not been any really great explanation for why that happened. Um, so, so there are certainly risks to, um, to to the financial system, but but the treasury secure the treasury market in general is still you know one of the most liquid markets mm -hmm. that we have. You can get off a significant size without moving the market very uh, right. very much, um, but it's still because of the size of it. Um, they, there's still a lot, a lot less right. liquidity than, than there was, say, uh, say four or five years ago. Completely unfair question, but it's unfair Thursday, Ira. <laughs> On Japan, the calculation from uh, some like George Cervellos is 1% of re reserves were spent today in this uh, strengthening of uh, Japanese yen. How much reserves can any given nation use before it becomes painful? Is it distant for a wealthy Japan or is it oh, oh too close? Well, I, I think in the case of Japan, they have so many reserves vis-a-vis -vis what they're trying to do that that I don't, uh, you know, they can go very far. Yeah. And remember that that central banks in particular, they can lever themselves by um, by basically printing money, right? So so they they have the ability to potentially um, go the other way. Now, I don't think the the Bank of Japan's problem right now is things like interest rate differentials, right? The fact that they didn't hike today, but they um, but they did intervene in the FX market is a, is significantly different than if they had actually raise interest rates above zero, right, which they still haven't done. Um, so, so so I think Japan is is in a more unique situation than, say, Europe, right, because Europe will eventually catch up to the U.S. So the way I see this playing out is the U.S. is going to stop hiking sometime in 2023, whether that's at 4.5% or 5%, somewhere right. in that range, which the dot plot yesterday that the Fed did show, showed. But eventually, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, they're going to catch up. And as they start to catch up, you're going to see a turn in some of the currency markets, I think. And, and it's just a it's just a matter of timing as opposed to uh, um, as opposed to what the path will ultimately be. What is your new research with your team on Jerome Powell's balance sheet? Was there something new to QT after the events of yesterday? Yeah, no, it was still very, uh, very much as we expected. They're going to let the balance sheet run off under the current right. system, probably through the end of the year, reevaluate maybe in December, definitely in January, and then decide on on what they're going to do in the future. Now, I, I don't think that they're going to increase the pace of Treasury runoff, but I do think, and this is important, is that there, it's possible that they could decide at some point to start selling mortgage-backed securities. That's not imminent. That's probably not anything that you're going to see before next February or March. 
March. But um, but it is something to keep on your radar because if if the the Federal Reserve wants to run off its portfolio faster than it currently is, that's probably the only realistic way that they're going to yeah. uh, they're going to do that. An experiment in progress, to say the least. Ira Jersey, a clinic there on liquidity. We next next time with Ira Jersey, we'll do solvency. Mm -hmm. Ira, thank you so much. If you want to flunk a fixed income test like I've enjoyed, folks, try to define solvency versus liquidity. Adults like Ira can do it, and me not so much. Let's do a data check. We can do that with a VIX of 27.29. Spike out to 30 yesterday. Crisis. Abramowitz moved the market forward. 27.29 on the VIX. A Dow up 107 points. Didn't make 29,000. 30,385. We do the standard and poor's 500 for John Farrow. Futures up 11. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.